If not, well, since we've done the countdown and we're ready to be live, I'm going to appreciate you for getting us started live. I'm going to uh, just go ahead since uh, commissioners are acknowledging uh, by uh, photo to be here, then I will go ahead and say Welcome, everyone. Today is June 27, 2023. This is the briefing portion of the Planning Commission meeting. I'm going to start with a little bit of an access check. Um, right now, it's Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you. And Commissioner Burton Polk. Thank you. So, welcome. Uh, this is the briefing session for the Planning Commission. Briefing means that cases are heard as a preliminary public presentation for initial questions from the commission. Public testimony is not taken at this time. A reminder to our presenters, clearly describe which slides you are presenting to assist those that are participating via audio. On the agenda today for briefing, we have three items and I'm going to go through those and read them. Briefing agenda item A is DCP-ZDR-2023-03325, at 4401 Penn Avenue. That's new construction for UPMC, a Heart Institute in the EMI, Central Lawrenceville neighborhood. Agenda item B is DCP-ZDR-2022-13515, at 2929 Smallman Street. That's new construction for a multi-unit residential in the RIV IMU Strip District neighborhood. Agenda item C is DCP-ZDR-2022-13518 at 6 um, 30th Street. And that's new construction for a multi-unit residential in the RIV IMU Strip District Neighborhood. For briefing, we are going to take agenda item A um, first, and then we'll take agenda items B and C together. Uh, for now, I'll read agenda item A in again. That's DCP-ZDR-2023-03325 at 4401 Penn Avenue. That's new construction again from UPMC, Heart Institute in the EMI, Central Lawrenceville neighborhood, and presenting that for us today is Ms. Rakis. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commission members. And as our uh, applicant team gets let in, if we can just do a quick uh, sound check with them. Sean, you want to unmute and just make sure we can hear you. Yes, I am here. Perfect. Thanks so much. So I'll do a quick introduction, then we'll turn it over to you to make your presentation. So this is an application uh, filed by Children's Hospital for an addition to the existing hospital use. Uh, the application includes approximately 50,000 gross square feet of additional hospital use for Children's Hospital, which is a project development plan before Planning Commission. Uh, the applica application was reviewed against the institutional master plan adopted in 2013, uh, and it complies with the parameters outlined there. A staff reviewed the project and staff design review and provided urban design targets, but CDAP was not recommended. The applicants' responses to the urban de design tar targets uh, were reviewed by staff and they found them adequate. Stormwater management wasn't required as the construction is proposed over the existing structure. A transportation impact memo was submitted to DOMI and is currently under review. And a development activities meeting was not required as there is no registered community organization in this location. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to the applicant to make their presentation. Hi, thank you. This is Diane Hopp. Hopp. Just a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Diane, and I'm the president of UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Thank you for having us today. Myself and uh, Kyle will be presenting a few of the slides. I would just like to give a very brief intro to why the project is being put forth uh, to the city. I would say this is an expansion on top of our mid-campus garage, which will be three stories, 50,000 square feet. It is to expand an existing 
Heart Institute program that we have here currently at Children's Hospital and had since we moved in in 2009. Our heart program is a longstanding program of excellence. It's a top program noted in the country, one of the top 10 and in the past few years has actually been up there as number two and three. The reasons for expansion are primarily surrounded by growth new technology that's needed that we're out of space in our current facility, and really to create a heart-centric institute for our children and adults that we see here in our adult congenital heart program to come to the hospital, enter, have their procedures, and be taken care of by those folks that focus on improving children and adults with heart conditions. It is part of our master facility plan and at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions at the end. I think I'm going to, those are the reasons for the project, but I'm gonna ask Hal to take us through a few of the slides. And then at the end, I'll come back to just say a few words for a moment or two as it relates to our community support. And I really thank you for having us today to present this important and exciting project that our, our hospital needs and the patients and families, both locally in the city and beyond are looking to us to deliver the extraordinary care. So with that, Hal, I'll turn it over to you to go through some of the graphics and the plan. Thanks, Diane. What a great uh, introduction that was. Uh, hi, everyone. Kyle Weissman. I'm a principal and an architect with HGA. Um, I'm also working with DRS, a local architect. Scott was not able to join today due to PTO, but he'll be on the full planning commission meeting going forward with me as my partner on the design team. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I just want to start with grounding us in the, um, the project site. So the project site, as uh, Kate alluded to, is being built on top of the, the mid-campus garage um on the north side of the the campus with a, a connecting bridge back to the existing hospital next slide please uh so our new building uh is the the portion highlighted in orange there which is the heart institute it's going to be comprised of three floors which we'll describe in more detail here in a second along with um a connecting bridge which is the the piece, the, the narrow orange piece that goes back to the existing hospital uh, for uh, clinical connection back to the fourth floor. Next slide, please. Uh, zooming in a little bit on the, the corner of our project site, uh, just wanted to allude that we have very minimal uh, site disturbance on this uh, for this project on the site at the, the street level um, due to the project being completely built on top of the uh, existing parking deck. One of the comments that we received from staff was uh, regarding the protection of tree and existing landscape. Um, so I wanted to just clarify for everyone, we will be doing everything in our power during construction uh, to protect those existing trees. If anything is damaged, we'll be replacing in kind the existing landscape, and landscape at the street grade uh, as part of the construction project uh, if necessary. Next slide. Wanted to describe for the, the commission today the the access for um, entering this this project site. Um, the if, for those of you that are familiar with the the campus, there is a parking uh, deck entry that you can see right in the middle of the plan diagram. Uh, part of this uh, project is adding uh, some handrails that are in blue there uh, to protect pedestrians and direct them to the controlled crosswalk to access the uh, the parking deck stair as well as the Heart Institute stair and elevators if someone is going to enter the site from uh, the street grade or from the existing campus at grade level. Really, the goal is to provide additional uh, pedestrian protection so people aren't crossing um, traffic at that uh, parking deck entry. So really trying to provide a barrier that provides people with navigation back to a, a crosswalk to a controlled portal to get back to the project site. Next slide, please. When we go up to the, the third floor, um, that really is the first floor of our project site on the on top of the parking deck is the third floor. Um, we will be removing some uh, parking spaces to build out the third floor of this Heart Institute project. Um, we will also have a controlled entry for the Heart Institute at this area. As part of that, we are providing a, a turnaround as diagrammed here, along with uh, bollard protection uh, for the building and preventing uh, cars from uh, interacting with the building um, and a turnaround for those cars to navigate back down the parking deck on level three. Next slide. All right, I wanna touch on how we uh, are aligned to the um, uh, the IMP that was approved back in 2013. 
Next slide, please. So uh, the, the main takeaway for us and for the Planning Commission on uh, for this project is we are actually uh, proposing substantially less new built environment as part of uh, this project from what was previously approved in the IMP. So looking at that from a maximum floor area, the IMP was approved at about 180,000 square feet. We're only developing right, right above 50,000 square feet as part of this project. Um, we also are in direct alignment with all of the other uh, elements of building height being substantially under the building height uh, allowed for the IMP, along with the strategy of building fully on top of the parking deck with no impacts at the grade level. Next slide, please. When you look at that in uh, from a concept design perspective uh, in blue and the, the blue and white rendering or axon of the aerial view of the, the institutional master plan, you can see how much more growth was initially planned in the, the master plan. And then that's a little scaled down as you look at our concept plan of uh, three stories instead of uh, uh, six stories that was approved as part of the IMP. So uh, a much smaller building footprint and building scale on top of the parking deck, which we think fits really nicely into the existing campus. Next slide, please. As we look at the exterior design, uh, one of the things that was really important with us to yeah. us was trying to align to the existing the existing campus. One challenge just for context as we've gone through the, the review with the local communities for the design portion of this, uh, because we were building on top of a parking deck, it is almost structurally infeasible to put brick on top of this building. Uh, so the design team uh, elected to uh, use a champagne metal panel that has multiple shades of uh, champagne, playing off the idea of brick of not every brick's the same color, but the champagne metal panels are gonna have that air, that variegation, um, similar to uh, a brick uh, type of look. Additionally, uh, we felt the, the, the um, champagne metal panel uh, also aligns really nicely to the uh, the parking deck and is a nice uh, complementing element to the axons already on the or, uh, the um, axons already on the existing research building behind our project as well as uh, some of the MEP spaces on the um, uh, hospital itself. Additionally, it was really important for us to tie back to some of those really primary colors that you see on the campus uh, of the red, yellow, greens, oranges uh, for the window patterning. Uh, along with the really primary blue accent colors. So as you can see in our our tower, uh, stair tower, you can see the, the metal panel in blue wrapping that, tying back to those similar accents on the campus, along with the really playful uh, window map mullion patterning of the bright primary colors already on campus. Additionally, uh, those that are familiar with the campus know the, the corners of the building and accents of the, the copper metal panels. We are also tying some of that into our stair tower as a similar accent in a more contemporary way in the green panel there flanking the side of the uh, stair tower. Next slide, please. When you look at that from uh, a little further down uh, 45th Street, you can see how the, the building is floating above the parking deck. And really that champagne metal panel ties nicely into the, the concrete texture of the, the parking deck. And then again, adding some additional uh, green metal panel to call out that third floor entry from the parking deck, uh, trying to tie right back into the existing context of materials on campus. Next slide, please. A uh, little closer look at the um, the playfulness of the um, the mullions and tying back to the existing Rainbow Bridge beyond uh, double height window system that ties back to some of the uh, program elements occurring inside the building, along with the the beautiful colors that are uh, on campus, trying to really tie everything together from a design perspective. Next slide, please. And then a view from the level three parking that um, that level three entry that I described earlier for patients coming to the um, the New Heart Institute and seeing the, the simple building mass uh, floating on top of that um, uh, parking deck, tying back to the existing campus. Next slide, please. And then again on 45th Street, an experience for patients that or uh, pedestrians that may be at the streetscape looking up at the building and how the the scale of the project really is not, in our opinion, uh, dominating the context. It really sits nicely in a nice proportion uh, to the surrounding context and height of buildings uh, across the street as well as the parking deck. Nice. Next slide, please. 
And then finally, the the uh, bridge that we described earlier is really a back of house bridge um, for clinical connection. Um, simple metal panels that also are uh, seen on campus uh, for the the mechanical enclosures on the roofs uh, being tied into this um, uh, sky bridge back to level four uh, for that offstage connection. Next slide, please. I'm going to pass it back to John or Diane to talk about the community engagement for UPMC Children's. All right, thank you. I'll speak to this uh, very, very quickly, but I did want to share on the next slide that we commit to be continuing to be good community partners and wanted to remind folks of the work we do in the communities and just a few examples. But one is we're very proud of our Ronald McDonald Care Mobile, which has been around with us for decades. And this past year, we have seen ne nearly 1,200 families and kids that we've been able to help with free rides. We've been able to see over 1,000 children in the Care Mobile itself. Um, given 9,000 vaccines at schools. Um, so we're very proud and we will continue to do this work and continue to partner, particularly with the schools. It's, it's one of our newer initiatives that we are trying to pilot some telehealth to help some of the school nurses um, with patients who need care that access may be an issue. On the next slide, I also just, my second slide on the community work is reminding you of the work we do with our family care connections. We have had these FCC connection centers in six of some of our underserved areas, as you can see on the slide, Braddock, Lawrenceville, Mount Oliver, Penn Hills, Rankin, and Turtle Creek. I was out at one last week um, out in Turtle Creek, just understanding the great work that we do. I, I've been at Children's for nearly four decades, and I've seen the expansion of our family care connections to help with things such as community, further community engagement, children that need further development, helping with parenting. Um, we offer parenting classes and celebrations for families that don't have places to go. So we commit to being good partners and continuing to do our share of community work. With that, I think to um, I think we have one more uh, part of a presentation that yeah, Diane, uh, I will turn Diane, it over to Sean. Yeah, Diane, well, we have one more before it gets to me, but I just also want to mention part of our community engagements um, that we have already participated with Lawrenceville Corporation and on May 4th and Lawrenceville United on May 25th. Um, we had a good presentation in, in front of that group. It's just kind of similar to what we did here. Um, a lot of good questions came from that, um, but uh, they, they seem to be willing partners in, in this for this project that, that's moving forward. Um, so moving on the next, we have uh, Cindy from Trans Associates. She'll be describing the, the parking impacts to uh, this for this project. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Cindy Jample, the president of Trans Associates Engineering Consultants, and I will provide a summary of the parking and brief traffic uh, look we took at the project. Next slide, please. We did meet with or speak with Domi about what needed to be um, evaluated, and that's what we've done and uh, contained in the report that they are presently uh, reviewing. One thing that we looked at is changes in on-campus parking. As you can see in the, the diagram to the left, there are three garages on the campus presently. The building will be placed on part of the mid-campus garage, which presently has 220 spaces uh, and is currently all used by patients and visitors. In order to keep patients and visitors close to the places that they need to go within the um, hospital buildings, what we will be doing is compensating for the loss of 50 spaces due to construction in the mid-campus garage by allowing there's flow between the mid-campus and the north garage, allowing 88 spaces in the north garage, which is predominantly employees right now, to become assigned to patients and visitors. That keeps the patients and visitors close to their destinations. Then for those who are displaced from the North Garage, next slide, please. There's an off-campus shuttle lot as shown in this figure. It's got a little over 1,400 spaces in it and presently about 700 or 750 spaces are used. Uh, so the people that are employees that are displaced from the North Garage will be parking in the shuttle lot 
which operates uh, Monday through Friday. There is a shuttle that runs frequently between the lot and the main campus of the hospital uh, with shuttle routes that were part of the approved master plan that's still in place. And so that's how we intend to deal with uh, the minor changes in parking. Next slide, please. We also looked at the relocation of trips. We do have some employees coming out of the North Garage and going down to the shuttle lot. The number of vehicles doing that's very small. We anticipate that all of the patients and visitors uh, will continue to enter through the two driveways on 44th and 45th Street to the mid-campus garage and no changes will occur there. The largest shift in the number of spaces per direction in a peak hour is 16, which is really a very small number in the grand scheme of traffic in the area. Next slide, please. This is a uh, this is a graphic that shows how parking is used right now. The pink garage is the mid-campus garage shown as public parking, and the staff parking in the north garage is over there shown in blue. Next slide, please. With changes on level two, 88 more spaces will be added for uh, patient visitor parking in the North Garage. So this is this is the parking field that they'll see when they enter, and it'll be easily understandable and accessible uh, to the patients and visitors who park there. Next slide, please. Okay, next. Yep, so that would be me. Uh, again, my name is Sean McCloskey. I'm the project director of construction for UPMC that'll be overseeing this project. Uh, what I wanted to bring to the commission's attention today is is a couple of the uh, the impacts that that will happen during this project. Uh, but first, uh, just a brief overview of schedule. Uh, we are looking at a two year long project. Uh, we are hoping to get through uh, the commission and permitting uh, and get be able to start construction by late this year. Uh, with that, that'll put us to a December of 2025 final occupancy of the building. Part of that construction, uh, there's a new areaway that we need to build along 45th Street. Um, that'll be one of the first things that we have to do. There's some mechanical equipment in the basement area that we need to relocate for our foundations um, that will that will uh, cause us to build, and that is why we need to build this. Part of this is that we will have to do a single lane closure along 45th Street in order for us to the contractor to build the uh, build the area away. Uh, we are currently looking at a two to four month schedule for that. Um, so during that time period, you know, there'll be limited travel um, down or up 45th Street and most likely be down 40, 45th is what we are going to probably maintain. Another portion I want to point out is that the contractor's trailer park and uh, material laydown. We plan on using the existing green space that is between the central plant and the plaza building. Or I'm sorry, central plant and the faculty pavilion. Uh, we will have that fenced in and have controlled access into that site. Uh, at the end of the project, that's, that area will be returned to its uh, to its current state of the of the big lawn and grass area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a few months after, or a few, I didn't say a few months, but shortly after we get completed with the um, single lane closure, uh, when it's time to start erecting the structural steel, uh, we will need to be closing 45th Street in its entirety. Um, there is a significantly large crane that we have to be put in there um, in order to reach um, the other side of the garage uh, towards 44th Street. Um, there, we've looked at several options of several different ways, and this is really the only uh, option we have for, you know, erecting the steel. Um, good thing is, you know, we will we will maintain access from 45th Street to the entrance of the garage um, for, for access there. 44th Street will not be impacted during this project, um, so there will be, you know, free flow access from Penn Avenue down 44th Street. Um, you know, they'll have to go down Garvin Way and then reconnect to 45th Street. Um, this 
duration is approximately 10 to 12 months long. Um, that's how it's going to, it's all long. It's going to take us to erect the structural steel. Plus we need to erect the skin of the building as well. So it's just not the steel. We're talking the metal panels, the studs, roof, you know, that's, that's roughly the time frame that we have. Um, and I believe that's all for construction impacts. Uh, I think the next slide is the thank you. Yes. So Diane, if you want to have any closing words or, or anybody. Sure, I'd be happy to, uh, we would be happy to entertain any questions you have. We again do want to say thank you on behalf of the UPMC Children's Hospital team here, as well as all of our patients and families that I'm confident will benefit from this new expanded Heart Institute. Well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, since that concludes your presentation, at this time, we do not take any public testimony, but we do open the floor, uh, commissioners, questions, comments, uh, any requests of Commissioner Dick. Okay, uh, this is more of a, an historical question, because I predate <laughs> this hospital, having worked at the old San Francis Hospital. Is this parking garage, uh, uh, which you're going to augment by the, the additional stories, the original one that was there from St. Francis, or was this rebuilt when you took over in 2009? Yeah. This was rebuilt, and Commissioner Dick, this would be, if you recall, the senior high-rise apartment building that was there on 44th Street. It would be yes. just next to that towards 45th Street, to just put you in the proximity okay. there. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. All of that. Thank you. Thank and you. the north, where's the north garage located? The north garage would be south of that. So the no, north no, garage no, is just no, no, south no. of the high rise. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And so the much. high rise now, as you probably know, our Ronald McDonald um, building, and we have about 84 uh, <laughs> patients and families in there that use it for housing for our more longer stay patients here. Very good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, um, that concludes Commissioner Dick, Commissioner Mingo. Hello. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so, uh, what, what are my questions? Um, the, I don't completely understand the new um, public and customer path into the Heart Institute. Can you explain that to me? I know right now, you most people are coming for a day visit to the Heart group park in the other parking garage on 44th street. They take the elevator up to the third floor or the fourth floor, and then they go enter the back way. They wind around and they back into the um, heart uh, clinic Yes, that in that way. So what's the new customer path for getting so into I, the heart I will clarify. Um, maybe you can pull up the slide and, and we can show um, the slide that has the, the new entrance, but I will clarify that right now we are building out two of the floors. The third floor will be shelled, which futuristically, it could be the clinic. But right now with this project, our heart clinic will still remain on the third floor back in the hippo, which it sounds like you're very familiar with that. And patients and families would still come in through front entrance in our Penn Avenue garage. It is patients that are coming for Cather cardiac catheterizations, other invasive and non-invasive procedures, cardiac MRIs. There will be pre-op and post-op areas there for those procedures. Those patients will then come through the mid-campus garage and have a separate entrance right into the new, the new construction building. And if you wanna see, if I can locate here, um, there will be, the picture up. Um, there will be an entrance off of 45th Street or the main entrance is going to be right on. When you come in the mid-campus garage, we'll have parking for these patients. And when you park on that third floor, if you can see here, you see some parking stalls in the white space there, they'll be able to go right in a main entrance on that floor there into the Heart Institute if you're having those types of cardiac procedures. And also, so, Diane, right? oh, and also, and also, each level of the parking garage yeah. is now. We are installing two elevators in the parking garage that are new, so you'll be able to park on any level of the parking garage and access an elevator up to the third floor 
of the parking garage, which would be the, recep the reception and waiting area. And then from there, the next floor up would be where all the cardiac cath labs and MRIs would be. Right, I was going to say that if you park in this parking garage now, there is a bridge that goes the back way. I don't know whether that's the third floor, yes. or the cafeteria floor, or the second The rainbow floor. bridge. Yeah, and so that is going to go away? No, or the rainbow that bridge stay? will remain. And if you're walking from the current North Garage to the cafeteria, as you described, across the rainbow bridge, it will be sitting right to your left, closest to the cafeteria. But the entrance, since our pa most, most patients are feeling there's gonna be parking in the mid-campus garage, there will be entrance at the mid-campus garage to get directly into the Heart Institute. Okay, and so this is not gonna impact the exterior um, cafeteria space mm -hmm. for the cafeteria either then? We, we will have, um, there will be, we will still have our outdoor patio, which our patients and our families and our employees use to go outside on the patio and have their lunches and dinners. That will still be there. There will be a part of it that there will be an overhang, which we actually think is a benefit. So part of it will be covered and part of it will be open, but the patio will still be there. Okay, great. I think I, I, think I understand now. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, we have been high-end users of Children's Hospital, but wow. the Children's Hospital is a wonderful, wonderful um, asset to our to our city. So, uh, thank you um, for the kind words. And if there's anything um, we can ever do for you that you're not getting, please do reach out. I'm easy to find. Thank here. you. We're, we're good. <laughs> um, so, and then my my last two questions are about views that I can't really see from these drawings. One is that there's a the new um, link between the existing heart clinic and the new heart institute, that new bridge that you're building on the backside, there's one view in your presentation which shows it quite close, but I don't have a really good understanding of what that's gonna look like from 44th Street. In particular, yeah. will the new lights, the new um, lighting on the inside of that also have an impact on the 44th Street experience? Maybe we can right, go one. to that slide. If you're on 44th Street now, coming up the hospital, you, this would be looking to the left there. And I do want to clarify that this bridge actually is connecting to the fourth floor of the main hospital. And the clinic in ambulatory cardiac is just below, it's on the third floor. You, you, you probably know that, Becky. Yeah, right, okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate it. That's why the rainbow bridge, I think that's what threw me off because the rainbow yes. bridge is lower and I was trying to understand this. Correct. So, and you can see I'm it there a little bit. Do you see it there towards the left? I do. Can... Yep. That's it. And the Ronald McDonald house is on the far left. left. Correct. So, so my question is how much of this can be seen if we step further back and we're really standing on 44th street? Do you guys have a drawing that you could bring maybe to the next meeting that just showed us, maybe it's even just a sliver to say that we're barely gonna see this because there are these ways that this happens or maybe you you have one. I'd love to understand the impact of being on 44th Street and seeing this. Sure, I think we can definitely bring that back. I know they, they shared a, a few more from the 45th Street side. Um, they showed that one as you're coming up the hill um, that was, I think, the previous slide, but we can certainly, um, we had a couple from the 45th side, so we could do that from the 44th Street side. These are yeah, all can, from more 45th. Yeah. yeah Which are Mingo, super can, helpful and answer yeah, so we, many questions. Yeah, okay. we can bring the, that other slide from 44th. It's really protected by the buildings, so you're not really going to see it, but we can show that context of any minor angle you may see on this bridge. I, I would love to see that we can't see it very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, Commissioner Mingo, if that concludes your questions. Uh, commissioners, I'm not seeing that there might be any other questions. Confirming, uh, hearing none, 
Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we'd like to see you bring uh, back the request of Commissioner Mingo, and uh, we'll see you in two. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Ron. All right. Uh, we're moving on uh, under briefing to agenda items uh, B and C. I'm going to read them in uh, and then um, hand it over to Mr. Kunak. Agenda item B is DCP-ZDR-2022-13515. At 2929 Smallman Street. Agenda item C, DCP ZDR 2022 13518 6 30th Street. And these uh, both are new construction for multi unit residential in the RIV IMU Strip District neighborhood. Uh, presenting that for us here today is Mr. Kunak. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, pause for a second while we promote our panelists and have a sound check. Jonathan and Ryan, can we please have a sound check? Uh, hello, this is Jonathan. Thank you. And, and Ryan. Oh, good afternoon. Um, all right. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Kim Kunak with Department of City Planning. Um, so back up a little bit. We've two applications. I'm going to read in the report separately for 2929 Smallman and then also 630th Street. Um, and then the applicants will present a combined um, application that includes both uh, projects. And um, as you'll see in the presentation, they're adjacent to each other and brought by the same applicant. Right. This uh, for our first application is DCP ZDR 2022-13515. It is a proposed six-story development that includes 46 ground level parking spaces, 36 bike parking spaces, and associated second floor amenity space. It's overall for the demolition and new construction of a multi-unit residential building with 105 dwelling units. Um, there is no registered community organization um, at this location, um, so no development activities meeting is required. Um, correspondence from the strip district neighbors in, is attached into your report. Um, the stormwater management plan uh, permit has been received and conceptual review has been um, approved. Um, this application was reviewed to staff design review in the contextual design advisory panel. Um, staff has no outstanding review comments. Uh, the transportation memo has been approved by DONI, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Um, this application is requesting um, two performance points. Um, the base height in the RIV IMU is 60 feet with a max height of 90 feet. The proposed building height is approximately 76 feet and the applicant is pursuing two points under urban fabric where structured parking is designed to allow conversion to other non-parking uses. Uh, the applicant statement of compliance is included in your report as well. Um, and then uh, the second application is DCP ZDR 2022-13518 um, for 630th Street, parcel 25F110. This is for demolition of an existing warehouse structure and new construction of a multi-unit residential building with 129 dwelling units. Uh, this proposed six-story development is located on the corner of Railroad Street and 30th Street and includes seven, um, 72 ground level parking spaces, 46 bike parking spaces, and associated second floor amenity space. As a staff note, Railroad Street in this location is owned by Allegheny Valley Railroad Company and not um, as a, by the city of Pittsburgh. Um, again, there's no registered community organization at this location, so no development activities meeting um, is required. Uh, the stormwater permit for this um, application has also received conceptual review approval, um, as well as you know, um, went through staff design review and CDAP, no outstanding design review comments. Um, and DOMI has also approved the transportation memo related to this project. Um, this application is requesting one performance point. Again, the base height in the RIV IMU is 60 feet, max height is 90 feet. 
Uh, the proposed building height is approximately 70 feet. Um, the applicant is pursuing one point under public art where at least 1% of the estimated gross construction cost is made as a one-time contribution to the city's public art fund. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our applicants to make their presentation. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Kevin. Uh, this is um, Jonathan Hudson uh, with the Hudson Companies. I'm a partner and principal with the Hudson Companies. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, present in front of a uh, planning commission uh, today. Uh, before I hand over the majority of the presentation to uh, Ryan and Davina with uh, Indivina Architects, I'll just give a really quick background on us and uh, the project. Um, so uh, the Hudson Companies, we're a Western Pennsylvania uh, based real estate development, investment and general construction company. So our main lines of, uh, uh, of business are the development of multifamily apartment buildings, uh, senior housing, uh, commercial office, and uh, other similar um, uh, properties. Uh, for this project specifically, uh, taking place at 2929 Smallman and 630th Street, we are the developer, uh, we are the builder and general contractor, uh, we are the owner, and we will be the uh, uh, eventual uh, manager and um, asset manager of the property. So. I always find it's very important to mention that we're along for every step of the ride here uh, with the development and the construction and the eventual management of this property. Um, as far as uh, Pittsburgh goes, we have one uh, other property in Oakland currently under construction. We received planning commission approval uh, back on that in December of 2021. And uh, we uh, own other assets, uh, mostly multifamily in the South side, shady side, Oakland, and just outside in the suburb areas of Pittsburgh. So uh, we're Western Pennsylvania based and we're very familiar uh, with the with the city and with the community and we're uh, really happy to continually uh, invest uh, within uh, the various neighborhoods that the city of Pittsburgh has. Uh, very quickly just about the project and I'll let uh, Ryan get in uh, more depth about the um, uh, specifics of each of the buildings. Um, as you'll see here in just a moment, uh, we and as Kevin um, uh, gave a great introduction to as well. Uh, we are developing two properties that are adjacent to one another on uh, two separate lots, uh, parcels here in the Strip District. Uh, those are both located on 630th and 2929 Smallman. Um, in combination together, uh, they are, uh, will comprise 234 uh, residential for rent uh, apartment units. Um, uh, there will be uh, on-site management offices, um, uh, various different amenities on site between both buildings and uh, parking as well on um, uh, with each uh, property. So uh, we've been in the uh, design stage for just under a year on this project. We've owned both parcels for right around two years. And um, as I will touch on uh, later uh, in the presentation here, uh, we've had um, a, a very, um, um, we've had a great ample opportunity uh, in, in amount of time to work with different various uh, local stakeholders, uh, the as uh, Kevin mentioned, the strip district neighbors that offered a letter of support, neighboring property owners, um, Kevin and others, um, and uh, Katie Reed on here as well from different various city planning and zoning departments as well. Uh, we've had um, a really great experience working with one another and understanding different components of the project and how we could propose something here today uh, to uh, the planning commission that will uh, be a great fit. So uh, we've really appreciated the opportunity to do that. And um, I'll just close it by saying, um, you know, the project that we're going to propose here uh, in which uh, Ryan and Davina is gonna get into in just a moment, we're proposing that all um, in line with the RIV IMU zoning and design standards. And um, uh, there's no uh, variances uh, being requested or anything of that matter. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and um, look forward to speaking more through the project. and. Um, with that, I will uh, let Ryan jump in there and um, we appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Ryan and Davina, Indivina Associate Architects. Thanks for uh, having us this afternoon. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, two separate projects, uh, I guess from a technical standpoint, we're gonna go ahead and present both projects as one continuous presentation. Uh, when we come back to you uh, in two weeks for hearing and action, we'll, we will separate those two projects into two independent presentations. Um, so again, this was done a little bit for expediency, uh, but again, we'll, we'll break it up uh, separately. So as was mentioned, two separate projects just to orient everybody uh, with the location. Uh, the two parcels are highlighted in red. 
Uh, they're situated between the 29th and 30th streets along Smallman and along on, along railroad. So railroad to be is basically on the northwest and Smallman on the southeast uh, with 30th on the northeast and uh, 29th on the southwest. Next slide, please. Just an aerial uh, of the existing conditions. Um, so the two uh, parcels are indicated, 29 and 29 Smallman is basically a mid block parcel. Uh, it is situated uh, basically adjacent to multi-story multifamily residential building uh, to the Southwest and then to um, uh, basically light industrial and commercial office space to the Northeast. Uh, 630th Street is a corner structure um, and basically it's situated uh, right at the corner there. And as Kevin mentioned, as we'll get in the presentation a little bit further along here, um, it is uh, oriented along railroad, uh, which I'm sure most of the commission members have seen lately, uh, presents a unique uh, situation on terms of site constraints and, and how we deal with that portion of the site. Uh, next slide, please. Just a couple orientation slides here, uh, give everybody a sense of where this is. So um, in the upper left corner, this is Smallman looking to the east, so northeast, et cetera. Uh, the building in the foreground with the red trim on it is the existing structure. It's uh, basically a two-story, uh, single-story, uh, was an industrial manufacturing uh, building that's been vacant for a couple of years now. Um, it was a paint, paint uh, chemical company. Uh, in the upper right corner, uh, this is small and looking back the other direction, uh, where you see in the foreground uh, existing historic commercial, uh, commercial office building, uh, and then a single-story um, in you know light industrial, I think it's food service. Uh, in the two lower images, uh, these are views along Spruce Way, which is the bisecting way between the two uh, parcels. So in the lower left corner, it's looking back towards uh, 29th Street. You see the existing structure uh, on the right-hand side that is situated at, 6th, uh, at 630th Street. And then the rear uh, of the existing structures on the left side there. Uh, and then in the lower right corner is the same view on Spruce looking the opposite direction. Um, and you see the, uh, the the building in the upper, basically left side of that. Next slide, please. Essentially the two images on the bottom stay the same because it's the same location, but in the upper two images here, it's a view of the existing uh, warehouse structure. Uh, it was a metals manufacturing uh, industrial building, I think up until 2017, and it's been vacant since then. Uh, and you see in the foreground, uh, the railroad tracks, as Kevin mentioned, is not city property. Uh, and then railroad streets sort of on the far right corner there. Next slide, please. So just uh, as Kevin mentioned, this uh, the both sites are located sort of right in the middle of the, uh, the RIV IMU district. Uh, they con currently the um, uh, railroad street property is one single parcel. And then the Swanland Street is two parcels that will be consolidated into a single parcel. Next slide. Uh, so this is just an overview of the zoning requirements for uh, 29, 29 Smallman. Uh, so again, located in the RIV IMU district uh, from a site development standards, um, the uh, just quickly go through it front setback, uh, there's zero uh, required and zero provided at ground level uh, within the RIV above 65 feet, a 10 foot setback is, is required. Uh, the building abides by that uh, essentially on the sixth floor, it's set back off Smallman by 10 feet. Uh, there's no rear setback required and non provided. The base height is, as Kevin mentioned, in the RIV district is 60 feet. The building's at 75 foot six, and the maximum height is 90 feet, uh, again, at 75 foot six. Um, from a bonus height standpoint, we're proposing to get an additional two points for additional two feet, uh, sorry, 20 feet of height above the 60 foot threshold. I'm uh, proposing to do the convertible ground level uh, that will allow our parking levels to be converted to non parking uses in the future. And you'll see that as we go through the presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, same um, overview here for the uh, 630th Street side of the, the project. So again, located in the RIV, um, same requirements from the, the setback uh, situation. In this case, the front setback uh, zero is required. However, because we are along uh, the railroad right of way, uh, the entire building is set back 10 feet uh, at ground level to provide for a 10 foot sidewalk. Uh, to be in accordance with the RIV uh, requirement for uh, continuous sidewalk in that location. Um, on the uh, the setback for the two um, public streets, so railroad and 30th, the building is required to be set back 10 feet above 65 feet in height, of which we uh, propose to do so. And then again, the base height here is 60, maximum height is 90. Uh, in both cases, we're proposing 70. Uh, in this case, we're only proposing to get a single point of additional height uh, going from 60 to 70 feet, and we are utilizing the public art 
um, bonus uh, point that's available uh, as Kevin mentioned. Next slide, please. Quickly turn it back over to Jonathan to give a, an overview of the time frame uh, that we've proposed the project or that's gone down the, the way here. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Ryan, I appreciate it. Um, uh, just very quickly, I'll, I'll go through here and uh, give it back to Ryan here in just a couple of slides. Uh, what I wanted to cover um, um, again quickly here is just where where have we been before today? So uh, of course we have met um, all requirements uh, in terms of uh, meetings, um, submissions, and similar requirements uh, to be here presenting to planning commission today. Uh, but most importantly, what I'd like to cover is just again where we've been and how things have uh, how that's impacted the project that we're talking about today. So we've had our pre-application meeting. Um, although that SDN is not a registered RCO, we've met with them uh, once initially, uh, had a follow-up meeting with them as well, and then attended the Strip District Neighbors uh, Town Hall um, uh, event that was open to the general public uh, within the neighborhood and presented there as well. Uh, subsequently have received a letter of support from them. Um, we've also received a letter of support from uh, Councilman Wilson's office, although it was just received not in time to submit for this presentation. We'll include that for the hearing and action meeting. And um, uh, again, not to be redundant, um, Ryan has mentioned the other two uh, project milestones there at the end that we have uh, received. Uh, Kevin rather has mentioned that. But um, uh, what's really important that I'd like to cover here is just during these uh, various meetings and submissions where we've had the opportunity to work with city staff members, uh, neighborhood groups, uh, neighboring um, uh, parcel owners uh, and, and property owners. Um, they've been um, uh, very um, open. Um, uh, it's been very open dialogue and we've been able to get some feedback and really make sure we include that within the project that we're presenting here today. Um, some things that uh, you may see is back in um, uh, the pre-app meeting and um, other meetings back in November, we were proposing a building that was 90 feet in height. Um, today, as um, uh, Ryan just mentioned, uh, we are slightly uh, lower in height. Um, essentially, we were able to um, um, you know, make sure we reached the goals within our business plan as the property developer and property owner. Um, so uh, today, uh, we're at 75 feet and 70 feet respectively from uh, both Smallman uh, and Railroad. Um, we see consistent feedback throughout this pro uh, um, throughout this project, both from the different neighborhood groups, neighboring property owners, and from the city about uh, the importance of really making sure the architecture uh, fits within uh, the uh, uh, strip district uh, neighborhood, and uh, most importantly, that the materiality of the project really fits within the neighborhood. So we're really happy to get into some renderings here shortly. Uh, not to take away from Ryan's presentation, but uh, we've received really great feedback on the material selection and that we're using um, a, a lot of brick and a lot of masonry that's really going to, to age uh, uh, gracefully here. So we're really happy to, to, to do that as well. Um, you know, one other piece of, of, of project feedback that we received from really everybody we talked to was the importance of activating uh, Smallman and really doing something on that ground level uh, so we we did, uh, although we're not doing retail or commercial, uh, we are doing uh, ground level uh, residential for, for rent apartment units there. So each of those units will have their own uh, individual entrance and have uh, somewhat of a small porch stoop that is up. Um, it's at a slightly higher elevation than uh, street level. So that's been um, very, very well received. And it's something that we're really happy to propose uh, to everybody here today. But um, uh, most importantly, I'd say throughout this process, what we continue to do is uh, foster an open, you know, two-way dialogue with any sort of stakeholders. So uh, thankfully, a couple of weeks, or hopefully, excuse me, a couple of weeks from now, we'll receive, um, uh, you know, approvals necessary to go forward from the commission. Uh, but, um, um, you know, we'll make sure to keep that dialogue with uh, stakeholders, neighboring property owners, um, uh, uh, very, very open and, and continue that as well uh, through, through the, you know, once we receive approvals all the way through construction to completion of the project. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a sample uh, development and construction schedule. Um, this is considering a, um, this is considering a uh, planning commission approval um, in July and that we would be able to start demolition within roughly 30 days uh, from planning commission approval. And um, this does consider an 18 to uh, 20 month construction schedule. 
Um, you know, granted, we do receive all uh, necessary permits and approvals needed to move forward with demolition and construction. It would be our intention to move forward with construction as soon as possible. Although I, I do just want to uh, make make note that these dates here are approximate, and I really wanted to show those um, uh, really just for anybody watching this presentation um, to understand the rough timeline of a of a building of this scale um, and size. Uh, and again, before I give it back to Ryan, I will close um, this anticipated construction development schedule. Uh, we have really good contacts with all neighboring property owners, the strip district neighbors, Councilman Wilson's office. Um, you know, we're we're more than happy and willing to make sure we keep everybody apprised of this schedule going forward. Um, and I will hand it back to Ryan here, and I'll speak more at the end of the presentation with any questions. Thanks very much. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so quick rendering, we'll get into details here. Um, just wanted to sort of set the table for the Smallman Street building. So this is a view on Smallman, looking at the structure, uh, sort of looking to the Northwest. Uh, next slide, please. Certainly touch on the architecture in a second here. Um, in terms of the existing site plan, as mentioned, there's an existing building there. It's highlighted in pink, uh, a, kind of a unique condition here on the site. Uh, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, Right now, there's a sort of continuous curb cut for the entire length of the site as essentially the entire length of that building was utilized for uh, front end loading on Smallman. Um, so obviously a, a great benefit to the project would be to uh, re reinforce that existing sidewalk uh, and create a, a more cohesive pedestrian experience rather than having you know the light industrial use that's there now. Next slide, please. So as we shift into the proposed project, um, to kind of have three main components on the ground level. Uh, the blue area is essentially the entrance point to the building, uh, the building lobby fronting on Smallman. Uh, all the sort of back of house elements and such extend towards the, the rear of the project on Spruce. So that's bike parking, uh, utility components, et cetera. Uh, and then as Jonathan mentioned, uh, in an effort to uh, create a kind of unique and a, a little bit of dy dynamic facade condition along Smallman, uh, we've introduced uh, five uh, of the residential units that are actually set back with the raised uh, sort of continuous corridor uh, inboard of the building, uh, kind of creating a nice little plan to let nice little sort of front porch for those units. Uh, they each would have a front door off the that that pathway um, and really kind of creating a nice active zone, uh, obviously in contrast to having that uh, having internal parking extending all the way to the facade. Uh, which certainly occurs in, in other projects and as you'll see occurs on the railroad street project uh, but again really wanted to sort of uh, accentuate the the existing um, pedestrian uh, walkway that exists there now along along smallman and really accentuate that further um, as was mentioned the project uh, is 105 units uh, we're proposing to have 46 cars on site that's the whole gray area that's access access off the spruce way uh, we've uh, designed in such a way that there's three entrance points uh, to create three individual zones of vehicular access, uh, thereby to maximize the efficiency of the garage rather than having internal circulation, basically utilizing Spruce Way for that access. And we'll also have internal loading uh, within the building uh, to keep all the ac activity uh, and such off, uh, off Spruce Way and certainly off Smallman. So currently the proposed project has no curb cuts on Smallman uh, in contrast to the existing condition. Uh, next slide. As we extend up to the second floor, uh, the building actually sets back uh, on the on the left side or the west side of the building. Uh, we're setting it back 10 feet off the property line. So the, the ground level extends the property line on both sides. On the second level extends back 10 feet. And as you'll see on the upper levels, levels two, or sorry, levels three through six, it again sets back on the east side 10 feet. So really pulling the building significantly back off its adjacent property lines. Uh, to create a nice breathing space between the adjacent parcels and also allow for you know functionality of those facades. So as the building extends upward off the plinth, we have a U-shape or let's say a shallow C-shape uh, plan. Uh, the majority of the building's amenities occur on this floor. So all the areas highlighted in blue are, uh, are amenities that are actually being, that are intended to be used by both buildings. Um, and then there would be a pool uh, pool deck uh, on the uh, on the Spruce Way uh, side, as well as some sort of private decks for the units that front on that side. Next slide, please. Just quickly, uh, the upper floor is fairly typical uh, as you extend upward. Uh, it's fairly one one bedroom heavy project uh, in this with two bedrooms basically at the anchor points of the wings, uh, one bedrooms and two bedrooms fronting on Smallman, and a series of one bedrooms along uh, the inset portion of the building. Next slide, please. 
And as mentioned before, um, the uh, sixth floor of the building along Smallman sets back 10 feet. That creates a nice continuous pathway, uh, con excuse me, continuous patio uh, for which each one of those units can uh, utilize that space. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is referencing the, uh, the performance point that we're proposing to do. So uh, as you remember, uh, we had essentially the entirety of the ground level as, um, uh, as, as parking at the rear and then residential at the ground level. One option uh, in this case would be to convert those zones to retail, should the retail environment be more uh, productive, in which case we would take over two of, the, uh, two of the three parking areas, maintain a smaller parking area that includes our loading zone, uh, with the remainder of those uh, those spaces becoming either retail or residential, uh, within the primary building service elements in blue would remain the same. So again, the intention of uh, abiding by that potential opportunity to convert the ground floor. Next slide, please. In conjunction with that, uh, the ground floor is uh, is per the rib standard uh, for the 15 foot uh, floor to floor condition to allow for that uh, that type of conversion. Um, so certainly that is a, a viable height condition for any future retail should that occur. Next slide, please. So getting back to the uh, the architecture, um, the building is set up in a sort of tripartite uh, architectural expression. The ground level highlighted here in gray uh, would be a clad uh, masonry, limestone, or precast uh, ashlar panel material uh, that would transition into full depth brick veneer uh, for levels two through four. And at the top of the building, metal panel cladding. Uh, that's the portion that's set back. Uh, really focused on accentuating the verticality of the building by uh, running the um, these sort of vertical piers uh, at uh, regular intervals uh, that then frame windows on all the typical floors. Those piers actually extend above the parapet line on the sixth floor to create this sort of crenellated uh, condition that's interspersed with uh, with paint aluminum handrail. Uh, and we've also introduced these sort of contrasting masonry veneer between the two window zones. Uh, to really accentuate that brick uh, brick condition as it extends off the uh, off the plinth. Uh, also, as you can see, the uh, the ground level where the retail zone is, we've got that sort of raised condition uh, set up where we'd have a planner zone. Uh, so basically, each one of the residents would have the opportunity of planting flowers and uh, and bushes or whatever they may, whatever it may be between the primary piers, uh, really to kind of create a nice um, personal experience for uh, people walking through, as also uh, as well as people that are living there. And then at the right-hand side, we have the, um, uh, the main building entrance, which is floor to ceiling uh, storefront glazing. Again, as I, as I mentioned on the plan side of things, um, kind of pretty unique condition uh, on the left side of the building, the existing multi-story converted warehouse uh, that is to the Southwest of the project, where you see kind of a sliver on the side there, um, that, uh, that actually has a large alleyway uh, between it and the property line of this, uh, this particular parcel. So it's about 20 feet wide, uh, 24 feet wide uh, to be exact. And then, as I mentioned, we're setting the building back another 10 feet from there as it extends upward. So really we've got about a 34 foot zone between that building and the face of our building. The intention there is obviously there's windows on that building, windows on the sides of our building. So really to create a nice um, uh, residential experience for both residents uh, to maintain view corridors and, and light and air, et cetera. Um, obviously, on the right-hand side, as I mentioned, we're setting it back 10 feet off that uh, right-hand side property. Currently, it's a single story, um, sort of partially single story, um, uh, light industrial use. Uh, but again, the strategy there is to, is to maintain the viability of those units uh, fronting on that side. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, opposite elevation on Spruce, uh, Spruce Way. So uh, all the areas in red are full depth masonry veneer. And then at the top of the building is the uh, metal panel cladding and sort of the contrast in color. Again, so as, as Jonathan mentioned, the, the focus here is to maintain that high quality materiality throughout the entirety of the building um, and, and really sort of continue the expression primarily of the building uh, directly next door, which uh, is obviously a beautiful turn of the century uh, converted warehouse structure. Next slide, please. Uh, so just from a material standpoint, um, this is just showing kind of the, uh, the, the, the images. So again, using a brick, a red brick, a, a dark brick, and then a metal panel. Next slide, please. Back to the rendering. Uh, so this is a view on Smallman, uh, looking at the uh, at sort of three dimensionality of the building. Um, on, the, uh, on the short sides of the building, again, that same materiality runs through. So brick veneer on all four sides of the building within that cap uh, and the dark contrasting material. Um, all the windows are intended to be very large scale aluminum frame windows, uh, really maximize views and, and sort of light and air into the units. 
Um, so, you know, that kind of creates this sort of, let's say trans transitional warehouse appearance with some modern, modern touches. Next slide, please. So how's the view uh, more at a pedestrian scale, giving you a better sense of how that inset uh, patio space works, you know, sort of liner planter, planter zones, the uh, sort of fence area, and then you have the steps into that space, um, you know, looking at providing lighting both on the face of the building, but we'll also have lighting internal to those spaces uh, to really make that a nice uh, unique space um, both day and night. Next slide, please. Just two quick slides just to give you a, more of an overview of the building scale uh, relative to uh, its neighbors. So the building to the left there, uh, you know, much taller building. Uh, and then the building to the in the foreground here, uh, again, smaller building. Obviously, it's not to, to say nothing will be built there in the future. But again, the idea is to uh, is to utilize what we can today, which is maximizing views and, and light and air for all the units on uh, on all sides of the building. Next slide. Just a quick model view of the building entrance, uh, looking at doing a canopy extending uh, slightly beyond the face of the building. Uh, and then we also have an inset uh, condition um, uh, for the main entrance lobby. Next slide, please. So getting into the more detail side of things, this is just the site plan uh, as proposed by Gateway Engineers um, for the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the project from stormwater management standpoint, as was mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, from, Preliminary review has been approved. Um, so the uh, uh, the intention is to do an underground retention uh, system, basically middle of the building uh, with an outlet into Spruce Way. Uh, so again, uh, in compliance with the city of Pittsburgh's stormwater management standards. Slide please. Uh, the landscape plan, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, currently it's just one continuous curb cut with no street trees. Uh, so the project's proposing to add, uh, looks like eight, uh, street trees in equal measure along the uh, length of the site. Obviously, significant improvement to that, to that condition. Uh, right now, it's proposed to uh, be, uh, uh, I guess, eight identical ivory silk uh, street trees. Next slide, please. So now we'll shift over to the 30th Street building. Uh, so again, just to reorient everybody, uh, this is looking at uh, railroad and 30th. Uh, looking at the uh, at the, the building uh, as it's situated in front of the, the train tracks, and we'll get into the architecture in a second. I'll quickly walk through the uh, through the plans. So next slide. This is the existing site plan. As was mentioned, it's a, it was a metals fabricating uh, warehouse structure. Uh, it's 100% lock coverage. So essentially, from the property line, property line on all four sides. Next slide, please. The proposed uh, condition uh, is basically, uh, as I mentioned, pulling the entirety of the proposed structure off of the railroad street side of uh, the, the property by 10 feet to abide by the 10 foot sidewalk requirements. Uh, there's already a 10 foot sidewalk on 30th street and we've been proposing about a four foot sidewalk uh, on Spruce Way. I should have mentioned that in the uh, Smallman Street project as well, proposing to add a sidewalk um, where none exists there today uh, at the rear of that property as well. Um, so on this project, um, the entrance point is at the corner of Railroad and 30th, uh, obviously anchoring that corner condition. Uh, in this case, we're doing a series of stacked uh, parking levels. So we have an entrance point off 30th Street where a vehicle would access uh, the parking garage at grade, and then they would extend upward at a 6% slope to the left. And then on Spruce Way, the uh, vehicles would access where that red arrow is in the lower left corner. They had entered into the garage, which is now below the, the, the garage level that has been accessed off 30th and then extend downward uh, below grade, uh, essentially for a partial basement condition. Um, so again, idea is to uh, maximize efficiency of the parking uh, and allow residents to park uh, on site as there's really not any street parking available uh, in proximate area uh, for this project. Um, the other thing I'll mention as we go through the presentation is that a portion of the building uh, it actually extends on railroad to create a colonnade, uh, which you see kind of those light lines on the on the railroad street sidewalk side. Um, and you know the intention there is to kind of create a very unique uh, experience for pedestrians and residents along that side of the building, and sort of subsume a little bit of the of the sidewalk experience uh, in in a more uh, kind of interesting way. Next slide, please. As we go to the upper floor, the building is oriented as an L shape. Um, so the second floor here again is programmed with um, uh, with multitude of of, uh, of amenity spaces for the residents. 
as you see sort of in the middle of the of the slide right above where it says spruce there's actually an exterior stairway uh, and that stairway is intended to allow residents of both buildings to access the, the patio here so people on the railroad can actually go on the patio take the stairs cross spruce way and enter the building on smallman and vice versa um, so really intended to create a nice uh, a nice neighborhood experience for residents uh, in that area and also to activate Spruce Way, which is currently an alleyway, but we're you know excited to kind of reinvigorate it uh, and remove to uh, you know this warehouse building be the most visibly uh, deteriorated building on the block there. Um, otherwise, the building again is situated uh, with units facing both Railroad 30th and the internal courtyard, uh, majority one bedrooms with a mixture of twos and studios uh, throughout the throughout the building. Next slide, please. A typical floor on levels three through five. Next slide, please. And then on the sixth floor, uh, the building sets back uh, the 10 foot along railroad. And um, on, uh, excuse me, on 30th Street, the building is already set back uh, 10 feet. Uh, so essentially we have the sidewalk on the outside of the property and we've already set back the building from levels two all the way up through six, uh, the 10 foot zone, um, rather than having it step uh, levels two through five and step back on six. Next slide, please. So architecturally, um, we took cues from the design uh, on Smallman, but obviously did not want to create two matching buildings, uh, particularly in the sense that this building is much longer uh, than Smallman. So we wanted to really break it into a more of a series of architectural components. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have this sort of full five-story uh, metal clad uh, assembly with large storefront windows, projecting balconies, uh, and really oriented more of a frame piece of architecture. The middle zone, uh, levels two through five, is clad in a light colored masonry veneer. And then the remaining zone that extends over to the uh, to the western, now the right-hand side property line, uh, is the same red brick veneer that we have at Smallman that then extends upward on the sixth floor and wraps uh, the parapet as you extend through there. At ground level, um, we have the uh, 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 a large number of windows, uh, as you might mention, or might remember from the the plan, we have uh, internal parking throughout that zone, but the intention is to really not make that opaque. Uh, so instead, really illuminating that whole zone, uh, you know, day and night. Uh, so really continuing the window patterning on the ground level. As you can see, sort of, let's say, I don't know, a little more than half the length of the building. Uh, you can see this sort of series of columns. So that represents the colonnade that I mentioned, where we have a, a covered uh, walkway, a covered sidewalk that extends from the corners of 30th all the way, you know, a little bit past halfway of the, of the footprint of the building. Again, really trying to create some three-dimensionality and, and some uh, complexity to the facade. Next slide, please. As we wrap to the uh, spruce way elevation, again, masonry veneer uh, for the entirety of the structure. Um, the upper floors on the right-hand side are clad in the red brick. And then the majority of the, the, the remaining side that is pushed back was clad in light-colored brick. The idea there again is to reduce the scale and create a little bit of complexity to the facade. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a view, sort of a little combination view. Um, on the right-hand side is 30th Street uh, building on 30th Street. So that same articulation of the colonnade extends along that side, only it's now acting as a pilaster. Uh, you have the vehicular access point uh, to, the, to the building on 30th Street and then red brick extending upward with that clad metal panel corner condition. The left side image here is you're seeing sort of the Smallman Street building in the distance, uh, you know, again, trying to sort of unite the two buildings in a certain way uh, from their materiality and, and sort of the, the expression of their coloration, but not necessarily the exact uh, identical condition. As you can also see, uh, there's a very heavy emphasis on the uh, projecting balconies, sort of inset and projecting balconies on 30th Street, uh, whereas we do not have balconies on Smallman. Next slide, please. So materiality, uh, well, two slides of materiality here for railroad, uh, red brick cladding, uh, again, same coloration, and then a, uh, a metal panel cladding uh, for the, the areas that are not brick, and then uh, painted aluminum window and door, door assemblies throughout. Next slide, please. So just representing the accent brick, so using a building brick uh, that has sort of a, a variation in color, light gray as the primary component, but with some uh, dark gray interjection to, to create a nice, uh, textured veneer. Next slide, please. So getting back to the rendering here, uh, again, really trying to break up the mass of the building, uh, really reading it as sort of this larger red brick component that then has the interjecting uh, metal panel anchor at the corner, as well as the light, light uh, veneer uh, in the middle of the block. Next slide, please. 
uh, more pedestrian uh, zoomed in version here. So this is showing you sort of the expression of the colonnade, um, looking at, uh, you know, interjecting some nice decorative lighting throughout the entire length of that space, really making it a unique condition, um, you know, and, and kind of creating a nice covered uh, experience for people accessing the building and then maximizing glazing and, and floor, floor to ceiling um, storefront along the facade. And as you see on the upper level, as I mentioned, we're setting back the entirety of the building on 30th Street to create a nice continuous wraparound patio on the second floor within the balconies projecting above that. Next slide, please. These represent just a couple more views, uh, just more model snapshots. This is looking the opposite direction towards uh, the intersection of 30th and Railroad. You get a, a sense of the colonnade that is interspersed with the street trees that we'll be providing. Next slide, please. Also, uh, yep, uh, so this is on 30th Street. Just again, looking at the, the, the building from a little bit different perspective. Next slide, please. A view of the lobby, uh, also looking at uh, including some, um, some planter boxes to create some, some greenery and some, uh, some liveliness along the uh, colonnade space uh, between, the, um, between the, 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 the piers or the columns. Next slide, please. So shifting into the uh, site plan. So this is the proposed site plan. Uh, so uh, the area in the building is now uh, it's highlighted in pink. Uh, as mentioned before, the previous building is 100% lot coverage. This is obviously reducing that by 10 feet on the top side, providing a sidewalk on all, all three open sides. Uh, and then the left side is a demising, demising property line. So uh, obviously no, no sidewalk on that side. Next slide, please. Stormwater management uh, in this case is proposing to do the same thing as Smallman. So uh, underground tank uh, that would um, be connected out to Spruce Way. Next slide, please. Landscape plan, we're proposing to add uh, eight street trees, four on the railroad side and four on 30th Street. Next slide, please. So this is the cumulative uh, solar study um, for the two buildings as they sit. Um, so essentially uh, in March, uh, you've got the, the shading at the early morning is basically to the Northwest of the, of the site. Um, as you get to the basically probably about 11 onward, uh, the buildings are essentially only casting shadows on each other. Um, so Smallman's casting a shadow on the uh, on the courtyard space of uh, railroad and railroads casting shadow across railroad street. So not impacting any adjacent properties. And then uh, in the afternoon, really essentially a full Easter expression of shadow uh, extending across 30th street, which into what is now a surface parking lot. Um, in June, uh, basically the same condition, uh, a little bit higher higher sun conditions, so therefore a lot less shadow expression. Uh, you go to the next slide, please. And then, you know, as the worst for anything uh, in the winter where the sun's the lowest, uh, the buildings are casting uh, shadows to the north, uh, again, on, the, on each other or on, on the railroad building uh, at midday and then out onto the surface parking lot to the northeast in the afternoon. Um, this, I guess, want to just mention this is also including the shadow study for the proposed nine story building that's occurred that's being uh, proposed for directly uh, to the south across Smallman. Um, so, particularly December 21st, that building would actually be casting a rather significant shadow on Smallman, uh, just as much as Smallman is casting a shadow on Railroad. Next slide, please. I think this, we're wrapping up here. Uh, I just want to include the construction management plan. Um, so this has been submitted to the city uh, as indicated by gateway engineers. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, the projects are proposed to be built at the same time, uh, which allows uh, for some efficiencies of scale as well as uh, limiting the impact uh, to the surrounding area. Um, so really looking at uh, closing off Spruce Way, not impacting any adjacent property owners, really just kind of interlinking the two. And that'll provide a, a, an opportunity for contractor access uh, to both sites I'll take a portion of Smallman uh, rerouting traffic to allow for an access gate uh, extending uh, essentially into the into the uh, roadway there, um, and then obviously uh, providing all um, pedestrian signage at, at all intersections that would be affected by the project. Uh, and next slide, and I'll turn it back over to Jonathan to conclude. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, uh, Ryan, and. Um, uh, most importantly, thank you all of uh, uh, Planning Commission here. It's been a pleasure to uh, present to you all here today, and uh, it's been a, a great process working with everybody from 
uh, city planning and zoning staff, um, other stakeholders, neighborhood groups, adjacent property owners, uh, the councilman's office, and uh, everybody else that's um, had some sort of involvement and in communication with us in this project. So uh, we um, appreciate the opportunity once again and look forward uh, to uh, the upcoming meeting. Um, again, the hearing and action meeting two weeks from now. And um, you know, with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions um, at this point in time. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you uh, to the applicant for the presentation. I do believe that I saw um, a message where Mr. Uh, Levine has needs let in, please and thank you. Um, given that, I, I think that um, we may want to open the floor for Mr. Levine to comment uh, if he so chooses as part of the team since he was not in for uh, most of the session. You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, thank you. I'll just answer any questions if they come up. This, I don't think there's anything remarkable fair, in terms of the legal issues. Fair and reasonable. Um, commissioners, the presentation has concluded at this time. Are there any questions or comments? Commissioner Dick. Uh, just three short ones. Uh, just to refresh my memory, what is the Oakland project that you are currently constructing? Uh, yeah, so we uh, received planning commission approval in December of 2021 for a 148 unit uh, apartment building uh, that is at 419 Melwood Ave in Oakland. It is a uh, residential for rent apartment building and uh, currently under construction right now. And um, if you're if you're driving out on kind of Craig Street and uh, near the Porsche car dealership, you should see a uh, a crane pretty high up in the air right now. So um, currently still under construction, but uh, again, uh, was um, you know that was our first project, ground up development in the city, and we're really looking forward to this one being Does our. Does that have a working name to it? Title to it? Oh uh, yeah, it, uh, the the working name to it is the Julian. Um, okay. Yes, the name. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sure. Sure, the brief question is. Um, of course, yes. On the one of your buildings, you mentioned having uh, ground floor residential units. That's correct. Yeah, uh, and they have a stoop in front. Uh, does each of these also have an external accessible uh, entrance? Um, I'll, I'll interject. This is ahead, Ryan. Ryan. Yes. Yeah. All those units are from, are accessible from the internal corridor, shared corridor. But not from and the outside. Correct. Yep. Hmm. Okay. You, 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 there's no way you can do an ex external accessible entrance. In here. Uh, we would need to add another ramp. So we, we looked at that, um, basically you have an at-grade condition for the building entrance lobby, and then there's an internal ramp that services the common corridor, and then that would uh, provide internal access to those units. Okay, on uh, the last question, I, I think I understood you to say that the street trees you were planting are something like ivory silk, was that the name? I believe so, I was looking I've on the- I've never heard uh, of them, I just, I, obviously yeah. it's not a native plant, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I, is that an oriental uh, plant? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. At uh, selected by our engineer partners, and I can certainly check well, into it. Well, I would just sort of urge you, if possible, to do a, a native tree or sure. one native to a slightly southern, uh, zone, further southern zone that might become acclimated to this zone as, as climate changes, rather than I know, using. I know the there's good guidance from the city arborist, so we're happy to look into that as a follow up for the upcoming meeting. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Commissioner Dick, if that concludes your questions, Commissioner Mingo. Thank you. I, I do appreciate the use of the brick. Um, I, I think that um, it lends a very solid sort of building to a block that is deserving of, of such sort of solid stature. Thank you. As a building, um, I I am slightly concerned about the lighter brick color that you're using. I think you could look at East Side Bond or some of these other projects nearby and see that even though we don't have as much soot in our air, the discoloration from the yellow from the on the white light bricks um, may have your building look much more aged quickly than, uh, than, the, than the reddish quality is sort of a reason why we have the orange and red brick 
um, coming from our soils here. Um, I had, I, 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 there, um, I think the last thing is not really a question. It's just that the Smallman building, the 2229 Smallman building is lacking two facade drawings that you need to submit for the next time. That is the Western facade as it faces Smallman lofts and the eastern facade as it faces um, the adjoining uh, building. Those two are submitted for the um, building on Railroad Street, but not submitted for the Smallman Lofts. And I'd like to understand how that building relates to the Smallman Lofts in particular. Um, uh, and uh, I think that facade, those facade drawings would help me understand that. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll certainly provide that. And I, I, uh, I agree with your comment about the light colored brick. We're making a concerted effort to use a, um, to not use a white, white brick. Yeah, you know, to your point, the uh, East Side Bond used a absolute white on that project. This is um, kind of in the, that's like a darker gray sphere. But, uh, you know, as we get through the, through the uh, process a little bit further, I think that was our baseline. But uh, to your point, certainly want to make sure that it doesn't discolor or, or look old <laughs> after uh, after a while due to due the the environmental contaminants. So certainly well taken, and we'll we'll include that out those elevations as well. Yeah, thank you hey, for your comments, Commissioner O'Neill or uh, Commissioner Mingo. That concludes yours, Commissioner O'Neill. Do you have questions? For some reason, we can't hear you, Commissioner O'Neill. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Okay, yep. great. <laughs> Who knew? I could use the one microphone before and it would work and then it just would stop. Um, so thank you to Commissioner Mingo for those comments. I agree about this Smallman Street loss. I think it'll be helpful to understand how this building is relating to that. Uh, I know that Mr. Indovina mentioned that there's kind of an alleyway there and then your building is also a step back. Is that alleyway used for the Smallman Street loft access? Is it a, a car? Yeah. Path? Yeah, a little bit of context, sure. So the 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 alleyway is it is owned by the uh, small, uh, it's, it's owned by the strip lofts um, uh, condo building. So uh, they use it for parking of several vehicles. It's gated on both the Spruce Way and uh, uh, Smallman side. So there is a gate um, there and um, they use it for parking of uh, several residence vehicles. I'm not sure of the exact amount, but it, yeah, call it four to six vehicles there, but it is it is owned by them and um, it's not like a city alley or anything like that. Okay. And so windows on your building start at what level are they right along that way, that alleyway, or are they? Sure, I'm. I'm. I'm happy to let Ryan jump in. I don't want to steal his his thunder since he uh, since he designed it. But I think uh, what he'll jump in and say is that that alley is uh, 24 uh, feet wide, and then uh, on floors two through six, which is where our residential apartments begin within the building, uh, we're set back another 10 feet. So um, the grand total, we're about 34 feet um, away from where our windows uh, would be um, in the facade and where um, windows or patios of the uh, neighboring property would be situated. And, and Ryan, please feel free to jump in and clarify or add to that if you would so yeah, choose. So, so at ground level, uh, we would have a solid wall because it's on the property line and we're required to have a two hour rated wall. Uh, the ground level on their structure uh, is also solid. Basically, the windows don't start until the second floor, which is actually uh, significantly higher than the second floor of the proposed structure. So it's probably about 20 some feet. Um, but again, the uh, the uh, the elevation will provide will sort of help you clarify, understand what's going on over there. Okay. And your first level at that area, that's where the parking is. So it's not, yeah, correct. it makes sense that, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the rear part of the pro of the project is parking and the front corner is our sort of incoming utility component. So there's a, a incoming water service, a mechanical room and a dog wash station on, on that side of the, the building. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, just a little bit more information on the pedestrian experience along railroads. So you explained kind of that calling on situation. Um, what kind of safety 
implementation will be there? Will lights be on all the time? Um, are people, is that actually connecting to another sidewalk that exists there yet or? So the, we, we certainly are proposing to have a substantial lighting throughout both on the face of the building and internal of the colonnade. Um, right now, the adjacent parcel does not have a sidewalk. So neither basically extending all the way from 29th through 30th, there's no sidewalk. Obviously, um, that's a situation that occurs quite a bit uh, in this in the in this particular unique little location location. Um, but the uh, the assumption and sort of the uh, understanding of timing is that the adjacent parcel is uh, similar develop uh, strategy and would have a sidewalk in the very near future because those buildings are uh, not occupied right now. So um, basically something is going to occur there quickly and that would therefore link up the entirety of that that site from 29th through 30th. Okay. And then all of the vehicular access is off of Spruce Way for both properties? There's a uh, partial access. Yes, the major all of the access is on Smallman, excuse me, is on Spruce for the Smallman building. For the railroad building, half the cars access off Spruce and the other half access off the corner on 30th and Spruce. Okay. It's basically a tiered parking condition. Okay. And is Spruce two-way or one-way? It's currently two ways. Okay. And it'll remain two ways? Yep. Okay. Okay. I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, so given uh, commissioners have asked all the, the questions that they were looking to, uh, we thank you for your presentation. If you have nothing more, then we'll see you back in two weeks. Great. Thank you very thank much you very for much. your time and thank you. we'll look forward to following up. Thank you very much again. Thank, thank you, have a great rest of your day. Right. You, too. you as well, take care. Thank you. All right, so that concludes the briefing portion of today. Looks like it's um, 2.31. Commissioners, uh, could we be back in 10 or are we wanting to be back at 2.45? 10 minutes works for me. 10 minutes works for me as well. So I'll see us at 2.41. Thank you so much. See you soon.
Commissioner Dick, your mute button is off. Oh, sorry. Very sorry. I was just getting ready for the roll call, but I'll put it. You're right on time. We're going to call the session uh, back in order for June 27, 2023. Uh, commissioners, if you could turn your cameras on or otherwise acknowledge your presence, Commissioner Dick. <laughs> I'd like to ask that the court reporter identify himself, him or herself, please and thank you. Uh, Ms. Burton Folk, I believe you were addressing me as I was providing myself to a panelist. Um, you are just asking if I'm ready. Yes, I am. This is Dylan Duran. Thank you so much, Dylan. Welcome. Hello. Happy Tuesday. All right. We're going to wait to make sure all the commissioners are uh, with us. Looks like they are. All right. So... Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the hearing and action portion of the Planning Commission meeting for June 27, 2023. Hearing means that cases are presented for action by the Planning Commission. Hearing uh, means that cases will be presented for action. And we'd like to welcome our applicant presenters. A reminder to clearly describe which slides you are presenting so that'll assist those that are uh, participating via audio. First, we are going to um, do a check of commissioners that are here for attendance. Commissioner Blackwell. Commissioner Burton Falk, present. Commissioner Dick, here. Thank you. Commissioner Mingo, present. Thank you. Commissioner O'Neill. Commissioner Cantania? Present. Thank you. And I know that Commissioner O'Neill is here as well. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to read through the agenda. And the agenda is as follows. Agenda item A is approval of minutes. Agenda item B is correspondence. We are changing the agenda around slightly. Um, agenda item C is plan of lots. Agenda item D is hearing and action. And agenda item E is the director's report. Running up to agenda item um, A, we're going to do approval of minutes and commissioners. We are in receipt of May 30th, 2023 minutes. Given everyone has had an opportunity uh, to address any edits, is there a motion from the floor for approval for May 30th, 2023? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Dick. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Cantania. Um, all right, we'll do roll call. Commissioner Blackwell, Commissioner Burton Falk, aye. Commissioner Dick, aye. Thank you. Commissioner Mingo, aye. Commissioner O'Neill, and Commissioner Cantania, aye. All right, so that passes. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item number B or letter B, that is correspondence. We are in receipt for planning commission correspondence on June 27, 2023, uh, the following. For item DCP-MPZC-2021-01413, 
Allegheny General Institutional Master Plan, we have the following. Randy Smith, Mark P. Masterson, Executive Director of Neighborhood Community Development Fund, Sarah Bailey, Robert Bobek. Regarding Frick Park apartment zoning that has not been scheduled for planning, we have correspondence from Lawrence Hayhurst uh, regarding item DCP-ZDR-2023-02426, the standard. We are in receipt of something from Dr. Brittany McDonald, Executive Director of Uptown Partners of Pittsburgh. Regarding item DCP-ZDR-2022-13515, DCP-ZDR-2022-13515, Smallman, 30th Street. That correspondence is from Jeff Kloss. Finally, regarding item DCP-MPZC-2023-0054, uh, Council Bill 2023-1393, we are in receipt of something from Sergey Gorloff. All right, moving on to... Um, one additional item after correspondence, I would like to move to some organizational items and to discuss those briefly uh, will be Mr. Lehman. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Burton Falk. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that it was on the record um, that uh, for our former chair, Christine Mondor, um, had put in her, um, after over a decade of service, put in her uh, letter of resignation as the chair of the planning commission uh, due to uh, uh, just a, a hard conflict with her teaching schedule and the commission and certainly putting in <laughs> over 10 years is a uh, yes. small thing either. And uh, she served the commission uh, really wonderfully uh, and, and really served as a leader for the city in both areas of design and um, in the work of the commission and leadership for the planning department as well. Uh, so I wanna commend that uh, and acknowledge it. Uh, make sure that there's an opportunity for others here to uh, speak to that if you would like, but also uh, to turn to the business that does uh, create a need for us to, uh, for the commission to revisit officers and uh, it's my understanding that there is a potential nomination on the floor for a chair. Um, and Holly, is that something you're prepared? Yeah. No, I am prepared. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank Commissioner Mondor for her many years of service and very skillful and, and insightful uh, work that she did. And I, we all deeply appreciate that. And uh, in her stead, I would like to nominate LaShawn Burton Falk, as the new chairman of the Planning Commission. I second that motion. Is this the part where I can <laughs> go through with uh, commissioners? Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners. I uh, would definitely uh, accept and um, I'll do roll call based on that. I will need to abstain myself, uh, but we'll go through Commissioner Dick. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Commissioner, thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Aye. Thank you, and Commissioner Cantania. Aye. All right, thank you so much. Um, maybe at this time I should, um, I have a, a couple things I'd like to say here. Um, one, uh, and then I can pause for a moment um, for anyone else to say anything related to Chair Mondor. Uh, but I would like to say that Chair Mondor made some significant impact and contributions to the commission. Uh, her leadership and dedication uh, was absolutely appreciated, and I'm thankful to have served with Chair Mondor and look forward to continuing to see her impacts in other ways in, in our city. Um, 
if there is um, any anyone else that would like to say anything regarding uh, Chair Mondor, feel free at this time. Um, Commissioner Mingo. Yes, I think um, I appreciate Chair Mondor as well. Um, I've only served on the commission for six years, but she was a, a wonderful leader and a design advocate, um, a thoughtful responder about issues in the public realm and always very generous in her ability to, to acknowledge the positive aspects of a project, even though there were parts of the project that she may have hoped would change or may have found slightly disagreeable. So I, she was the master of um, communicating in that way in this public forum and I appreciate her. Okay, thank you for that, Commissioner Mingo. Anyone else? I wanna echo all the sentiments about Chair Mondor uh, and thank her for her all her hard work. I think we all see her on the commission meetings and the public sees her in these commission meetings do, doing such an excellent job. Uh, but I think we all know there was also a lot of background work and effort that she put in. So truly appreciated her work and looking forward to working with our new chair, Ms. Burton Polk. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner O'Neill. And I'd like to say uh, to the commissioners and staff and, uh, you know, those of you that are out there, uh, our city, I look forward to continued service with all of you. Um, thank you for your trust and confidence and having me as chair of the commission. I intend to serve well, uh, and I am honored. So thank you. Uh, and given uh, the uh, acceptance and uh, appreciate the uh, vote, we are now going to need a vice chair. Um, and go ahead, Mr. Lehman. I think I, I wanted to make sure uh, Deputy Director Dash had a moment. I think Edwards. Oh, I didn't see him. Yeah, I'm was, so sorry. That's okay. I was trying. I was trying to let other commissioners uh, speak on uh, Chair Mondor. Um, you know, I, I think you know, in speaking both for myself and for the director, I think we're very appreciative of the leadership that uh, that Chair Mondor exhibited um, over you know multiple administrations. Um, I think that that was seen both in the work that you know she really tried to navigate uh, as the commission chair over some of the largest developments that we've seen in generations that have come through the commission over the last decade. Um, but also in a lot of the the kind of inter integration and introduction of some of the places that, you know, were outside of traditional development review that, you know, that started to become uh, part of the commission's work. And so when we think about things like uh, the neighborhood planning program and pieces of the comprehensive plan and, and, and the work that was done there uh, by, by by the chairwoman. Uh, when we think about changes to zoning and, you know, kind of the navigation of the work uh, with staff on things like the performance points program, the riverfront zoning, um, you know, some of these other larger zoning, zoning projects uh, and, you know, her, her ability to, I think, both, you know, work with staff to navigate the public and the public process, uh, you know, not only through the commission process, but otherwise, um, you know, I think will really, um, you know, create a lasting impact on, you know, development in the city and how development happens and how the public are more integrated into the development review process. Um, you know, and, you know, are, are so are really grateful for kind of the, the legacy she's left, uh, you know, the, what, you know, kind of the, the footprint that you know has been created for for us to continue to to improve from, and you know are extremely excited, uh, you know, incoming chair Burton Falk uh, to be you know to be working with you as we you know get a comprehensive you know go underway with a citywide comprehensive planning effort, uh, and and you know improvements to uh, our zoning code and, and a lot of other ways, including including uh, you know changes to you know to housing and residential zoning. Um, you know, really look forward to your leadership and being able to uh, to take that mantle on and, you know, really continue to, uh, you know, be able to change the development landscape in the city for the better. Thank you, Mr. Dash. Very, very uh, well said. Those highlights are very important. Uh, and, and I'm glad that you shared those today because um, Chair Mondor deserves 
that um, just as well. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak? I don't want to speak over, you know, any any staff uh, related to Chair Mondor. Um, so this, um, so the one thing I would like to say is obviously I'm new to the commission and um, I think that, you know, I could echo a lot what everybody has said. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have enough opportunity to actually work with Commissioner uh, Mondor and learn from her um, skills, uh, absolutely amazing skills at um, speaking and, and dealing with a lot of the issues that we are dealing with. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure at least uh, seeing her. Thank you. Thank you, just as well. I appreciate it. Okay, um, so I will move to, now we need to um, look at the vice chair uh, position and I would like to uh, put a nomination up for uh, Rachel O'Neill, Commissioner Rachel O'Neill. Do I have, that's a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Commissioner Dick, thank you so much. So I'm gonna go uh, through the commissioners, Commissioner Burton Falk, obviously I, um, Commissioner Dick. I. Thank you, Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Cantania. <laughs> Aye. I don't think we get uh, Commissioner O'Neill to vote for Commissioner O'Neill. So thank you uh, so much, Commissioner O'Neill. The floor. No, oh, thank you so much. Uh, big shoes to fill. So I'm looking forward to continuing to work with everybody. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to roll back to um, our agenda, and I'm going to move to agenda item C, which is um, plan of lots. Uh, that will be, I, I do believe, permanently moved um, to that location. And under plan of lots, we've got one item. I'm going to read that in, and then we'll have Mr. Shepke uh, present. Agenda item number one under plan of lots is DCP dash lot dash 2023 dash 00794 at Terman Garden Homes. That's a major subdivision and that is in Brighton Heights. Uh, Mr. Shepke, would you like to read that in, please? And thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Falk. Um, this is the Terman Homes subdivision. It is the subdivision of three parcels into 36 parcels in a private drive. Uh, the proposed lots one through 34 would have frontage on Terman Gardens Drive, would have lot areas ranging from 3,215 square feet to 20,297 square feet. The proposed parcel A would have frontage on Ohio River Boulevard, it would be 62,720 square feet in area. Proposed parcel B would have frontage on Terman Gardens Drive and would be 4,409 square feet in area. The proposed lot Terman Gardens Drive would provide access to Terman Ave Avenue, or it would, sorry, the proposed Terman Gardens Drive would provide access to Terman Avenue for lots one through 23 and would be 19,968 square feet in area. A building that was formerly used for a group home, which is to be demolished, is located on the subject property. And the proposed motion is to, uh, or the recommended motion is to approve the Termin Home subdivision. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shepke, for reading that in. Um, at this time, we do open the floor for public testimony uh, regarding this item. Does there happen to be anyone? Uh, with a hand raised. There are no hands raised. Okay. Uh, so then, commissioners, at this time, do we have a motion from the floor to approve uh, the Term and Garden Homes uh, subdivision, major subdivision? So moved. All right. Commissioner O'Neill, do we have a second? Second. All right, Commissioner Dick, and I'm going to do roll call. That is Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Aye. 
Thank you. And Commissioner Cantania. Aye. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, motion passes. It carries. So we are moving on to agenda item D, which is hearing in action. For the item under hearing in action, we'll first hear the presentation, then we'll take public testimony, and then commission will deliberate and take action. Uh, reading in the one item that we have uh, under hearing in action today, which is item DCP-MPZC-2023-00524. Which is Council Bill 2023-1393, Fifth Avenue, bounded by Kelly Street, Frankstown Avenue, and the AVRR. This is a zone change petition for multiple parcels to change from an R1 uh, to a UI in the Homewood West neighborhood. Uh, presenting that here today is Mr. Kunak. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Kevin Kunak with the Department of City Planning. We're going to pause for a moment while we have a sound check from Mr. McKeegan and very shortly, Mr. Carter. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Kevin. I am here, Kevin. I was just adjusting my Good. curtains. It was too much light. The light looks great. Um, anyone else on the applicant team who's wishing to speak and have a sound check? Uh, yes, if you could please check that both uh, Lee May and Mark Ferguson are uh, admitted as panelists, please. I'm on. Thank you, Mark. And we're in the process of promoting Mr. Um, Mr. May. You're on mute, Mr. May. Got it. How's that? Thank you. Thanks. All right. Again, uh, thank you, Commissioners. Kevin Kunak with the Department of City Planning. This is for application um, DCP MPZC 2023-00525 um, slash Council Bill 2023-1393. Um, Council Bill 2023-1393 was introduced in City Council on April 4th, 2023, where it was referred to the Planning Commission on April 12th, 2023 for the Commission's report and recommendation. The legislation proposed to change the zoning district for, multi for multiple parcels generally bounded by Fifth Avenue, Kelly Street, Frankstown Avenue, and the Allegheny Valley Railroad Brilliant Line. A map of the current zoning and proposed is attached. Enactment of this rezoning will permit the involved property to be developed for uses permitted in the UI, Urban Industrial Zoning District. Property owners within 150 feet of the proposed zone change were notified of the proposal. Notice of this planning commission hearing was mailed to abutting property owners 21 days in advance, posted on the city planning website and posted on site. No, ap no application for development has been submitted to the planning department at this time. A development acti activities meeting was held on May 11th, 2023. The staff report is attached. Uh, the applicant's statement of compliance to the review criteria is also attached. Uh, the review criteria is listed in your um, hearing and action report. Uh, the recommended motion is that the Planning Commission recommends approval to City Council of the zone change petition um, to rezone the proposed parcels from residential single unit attached low density to urban industrial. And with that, I'll turn it over to our applicants. And I'm going to defer to Mr. Carter for a minute. Okay. Um... Good afternoon, everybody. First, I want to take this moment on behalf of City Councilman Ricky Burgess to thank outgoing Chair Christine Mondor for her years of dedicated service, both to the commission and to the city. And um, I can't thank you enough for your service. Next, I want to congratulate incoming Chair LaShawn burton Falk. Um, I've worked with you a lot through the years here at the Planning Commission and at the Zoning Board. And 
Um, I look forward to your continued service. I want to congratulate Commissioner Rachel O'Neill on being elected vice chair. Um, our days go back to when you were a lawyer at the law department, um, helping me figure out why the things that we wanted didn't quite work within the context <laughs> of the zoning code. Um, well, no, that's always helpful because we don't actually know as much as we think we do. And so we have to rely on our land use lawyers to help us not violate people's rights. Um, additionally, I want to say good afternoon to Commissioners Blackwell, Dash, Dietrich, Mingo, Dick, and our new commissioners, Quintanilla and Ruiz. Um, I think I got everybody. I also want to say hello to Corey Lehman, Kate Rakis, Kate Reed, Daniel Shepke, and Kevin Kunak. And I'm sure I missed somebody, so I apologize. Um, we're here today because several months ago, um, we were approached with uh, an idea to build a get-go gas station at the corner of Fifth Avenue and Frankstown Avenue. And as a lifelong resident of Homewood, I can tell you, um, it's always frustrating for me at night if I'm, you know, working late or out and about not having what I consider a safe, genuinely useful gas station in the neighborhood. I always have to drive to Waterworks or out to Penn Hills to the other get-go, or I have to come into East Liberty or find the sheets. Um, but our office, specifically Reverend Burgess's chief of staff and the councilman himself, did have concerns, and that resulted in months of back and forth with the develop with the team here about, you know, issues large and small, the, the variety of food that would be offered, and um, you know, the hours of operation and some of the amenities. And after working through that for several months, I think we reached a, p a position where. Reverend Burgess was comfortable in introducing the zone change petition because he believes this is a necessary addition to the community. Um, I believe one of the two other gas stations on the uh, uh, adjacent corners may be closing, but I can tell you none of them will be as function. None of them are as functional as this get go will be. Um, and so with that, Councilman Burgess was willing to introduce the zone change petition to change from residential single unit detached low density to urban industrial um, so that the next step of this can proceed. Um, I've had conversations with planning staff and I realize there are design questions. I remember from the briefing that Commissioner Quintanilla asked about uh, the side facing Frankstown Avenue and whether that was just going to be a red brick wall. And so I realize there are design issues that um, Frankly, the development team will have to work out with planning staff in the design phase of this, which is separate from whether or not we rezone the parcels so they can take that next step. Reverend Burgess um, sincerely requests that the commission grants a positive recommendation to this zone change request. And I will now turn it over to the development team, but I'm here to answer any other questions you may have. And I thank you for your time. Okay, um, thank you, Sean. Um, thank you to the members of the commission. Um, I would just like to echo everything that's been said about um, former Chair Mondor, both uh, as a member of the Planning Commission and in my professional involvement with her. Um, uh, I can only say that uh, uh, she is truly an asset to the city and um, um, I'm delighted she's still around and, and will still be able to participate uh, in city activities and to Commissioners Burton Falk and uh, Commissioner O'Neill. Um, best of luck, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, with that, I'd like to move to the presentation. Um, uh, as uh, Sean and Kevin indicated, we're talking about 19 uh, vacant parcels totaling about um, uh, one and a third acres uh, that lie roughly between Kelly Street and Frankstown Avenue, very close uh, to the intersection of those um, streets with uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, I would point out that both Kelly Street and Frankstown Avenue are 60 feet wide, uh, and they are, of course, the main uh, thoroughfares leading back into the greater Homewood uh, neighborhood. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
So this slide is uh, a slightly higher uh, view of the uh, neighborhood and the properties outlined in yellow. Um, uh, as you can see, this is a, a, a dense urban uh, environment. Uh, there are a multitude of different types of uses in and around the area. Uh, and I would uh, again just note uh, for the commissioner's uh, background that the urban industrial uh, zoning classification is actually a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's considered a mixed use um, uh, zoning district under the city's uh, code. Uh, it allows for a wide variety of uses, including multifamily uh, and the like. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? We've provided in the package uh, the uh, block and lot or tax parcel map um, of the uh, uh, proposed rezoning site. Um, again, the uh, rezoning site is outlined in yellow. Each of the parcels are identified uh, on this plan by their block and lot number. Um, I wanna point out here that the um, local fast food restaurant, which lies uh, between the rezoning site and Fifth Avenue, uh, will be part of the project if the project moves forward. Uh, and that site is already zoned uh, urban industrial. We'll, we'll depict that on a zoning map in a few minutes. Uh, the properties on the um, right-hand side of the screen, there is one uh, property, 125G66, uh, which is still owned uh, by uh, a private uh, individual. The other uh, tax parcels over there are vacant and are owned by the Allegheny Valley Railroad. So those are uh, those are railroad properties. If we could go to the next slide, please. And really these next three slides uh, in combination uh, are aerial views uh, of the um, uh, area going from 1995 to the present. We've included these three slides uh, to depict how uh, the property has gradually uh, become vacant over the years. Uh, most of the site was cleared uh, of structures between uh, the mid 1990s uh, in the early 2000s. So uh, the first slide is 1995 view. If we can go to the next slide, please. Go to 2006. Most of the structures have been demolished. Go to the next slide, please. 20, uh, 2017, there's one uh, building remaining. Uh, and by 2019, uh, the property is entirely vacant. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? For purposes of the record, we've included uh, a survey of the area to be rezoned uh, along with site information. Uh, again, the rezoning area is outlined in yellow. If we can go to the next slide, please. We've done an analysis of these 19 parcels under their current zoning classification, which is R1DL. None of the parcels uh, in their uh, current uh, condition uh, satisfy by any of the site development standards uh, for the R1DL uh, area. They are all too small. Uh, their width uh, uh, is too narrow. Uh, these are essentially uh, undevelopable, uh, uh, vacant orphan parcels almost, uh, absent some sort of uh, uh, consolidation. Would we go to the next slide, please? So this is a zoning map uh, of the area. As you can see across Frankstown Avenue from the uh, rezoning site, the rezoning site is outlined in blue uh, on this slide. So you can see across Frankstown Avenue, uh, there is an urban industrial district. Uh, you have the uh, neighborhood fast food restaurant and then an urban industrial district um, uh, across Fifth Avenue uh, and across uh, part of Kelly Street uh, from the site uh, is also an urban industrial district. An urban industrial district also exists uh, over uh, part of the railroad, uh, and we'll discuss the railroad condition in a few minutes. Uh, but as you can see, there is urban industrial uh, zoning uh, in, around, and immediately abutting uh, this property. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? This is a view of the property uh, looking from the east, uh, generally speaking, in other words, from the um, East Liberty area, looking back into Homewood. Uh, this aerial photograph um, uh, shows the uh, area to be rezoned outlined in yellow. Again, it's vacant, uh, fast food restaurant immediately between it and Fifth Avenue. Uh, and then this also, uh, we included this slide because it gives a good uh, depiction of the railroad condition uh, further into Homewood. Uh, and the barrier that that uh, uh, creates between uh, the site and the balance of the Homewood neighborhood. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? 
This is a view looking uh, uh, south and west uh, over the area to be rezoned, again, outlined in yellow. Uh, as you can see on this slide, there is a great deal of uh, heavy commercial uh, mixed use kind of activity going on uh, around the subject property. Uh, the railroad in this case is uh, towards the bottom of the uh, photograph. Um, and uh, 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 Frankstown Avenue is highlighted in yellow. Kelly Street would be the uh, street above uh, this, the, uh, the, uh, the property that's in gray. Uh, next slide, please. The next two slides um, are more ground level views in and around uh, the property. Uh, we're starting on Fifth Avenue with this slide. Uh, you can see some of the uh, existing developments there, a storage facility, other commercial buildings, uh, uh, the fast food restaurant, a gas station. Uh, next slide, please. A couple more views of the fast food uh, restaurant. And then uh, at the bottom of this slide, uh, two photographs uh, of the site uh, along Frankstown and along Kelly. Uh, again, just confirming its uh, vacant condition. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So these uh, slides are close-ups of the uh, railroad overpass, which we've mentioned before. Uh, this is a uh, substantial structure. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Uh, this, we all hope, will be the um, uh, part of the uh, bike pathway from uh, Aspen Wall extending back into the city. Um, I think there's a fair amount of work still to be done uh, with that project, but uh, uh, that's, that's the long-term plan. But otherwise, uh, the, this railroad overpass is, is certainly an existing condition that's going to be there for quite some time. Next slide, please. So as Sean indicated, uh, and Mr. May will go into this in a little greater depth in a few minutes, uh, the reason we're bringing this uh, zone change proposal before you uh, is to, uh, uh, we hope, develop this site with a get-go convenience store, uh, at, uh, including automobile fuel sales. Uh, I want to be candid that part of the discussion with uh, Reverend Burgess's uh, office was certainly directed towards uh, providing additional um, grocery and food uh, shopping opportunities for the neighborhood. Um, so this get-go is going to be a little bit different from uh, the ones you might encounter in the suburbs. Um, and Mr. May is going to go into that uh, in greater detail. But, but we're excited about uh, providing this opportunity uh, to that uh, part of the city. We go to the next slide, please. Sean had mentioned uh, a, a very, very conceptual and preliminary site plan. Uh, we just wanted to uh, put this in front of the commission, not really for discussion, but just to let you know uh, that this is kind of along the lines we're thinking. Uh, fuel sales uh, closer to Fifth Avenue, uh, the store located between uh, Kelly Street and uh, Frankstown Avenue further into the site, uh, heavily landscaped, um, a green buffer area uh, 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 as you're getting closer to the railroad bridge areas, uh, that buffer area may be available for uh, community type events that's yet to be worked out. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize as Sean did that um, this plan is by no means final. Uh, we did have a pre-application meeting before this uh, uh, zone change request was filed. Uh, we appreciate that there's quite a lot of work that still needs to go in to satisfy uh, not only the Department of City Planning's requirements, but also uh, those of the neighborhood. Uh, but um, uh, this is along the lines of what we're thinking about in terms of this development. Uh, so with that, uh, one more slide, please, and then I'll, and then I'll be quiet. This again is kind of a, a building perspective. Um, uh, heavy uh, use of brick on the building is, is part, of the, uh, part of the concept here. Uh, this is not gonna be um, uh, a less substantial suburban structure. Uh, uh, heavy architectural detail in terms of the types of windows, uh, the use of metal awnings uh, and the like. Uh, uh, how this ultimately lays out in terms of how it will be presented on the property is something yet to be de developed, but it will be a big brick building uh, of this type. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. May to discuss exactly what GetGo is proposing to go on uh, inside, uh, inside the store. All right. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Planning Commission members, as well as staff. Uh, next slide is our floor plan for the proposed GetGo. And as Kevin mentioned, this is it's not final, but uh, we're getting 
kind of nailing down what we want to be able to offer here. And what you'll see from this floor plan is we have uh, starting at the bottom where we have kind of our primary public entrance. Uh, that would be kind of the focal point of the uh, that facade. And then we also have another uh, primary or secondary public entrance to the right there, uh, which is um, kind of where the checkout area is kind of centrally located between those primary public entrances. But as you enter the store, what you'll find is different is that we're going to have an expanded uh, area for fresh bakery and fresh produce. Uh, but as you enter, that'll be, you know, like uh, face from the way it's oriented here to the right will be more of our grocery offerings and we'll have, you know, expanded frozen foods as well as chilled uh, food as well. And then, of course, uh, many grocery items. But as you'll notice on to the uh, left side of the floor plan, we have our made to order area and and which is an open uh, food prep area where customers will order food on the touch screens. And there's a kitchen behind that to support the uh, made to order food. Uh, and then we'll also have inside dining. Uh, so we'll have seating for at least uh, 30 uh, guests. And then uh, in the far right corner, you'll notice that we have uh, expanded restrooms with multiple fixtures to hopefully illuminate the, any lines uh, to, to create that benefit for the customers as well. Um, so this is, as Kevin mentioned, you know, we have many, when we say get-go, we have many different formats uh, throughout the uh, Pittsburgh area, but this is a totally new format for us, a uh, larger building. It's almost 6,400 square feet. Uh, and on the next slide, which we're, what we're really excited about here is uh, now, while these are actual photos from recent, recently opened get-go's, uh, what we're planning for this store here at Homewood is an even greater expanded uh, offering for fresh produce. We'll have uh, sliced deli meats, fresh meats, you know, like ground beef, chicken, et cetera. Uh, and then, uh, you know, of course, we'll have... Uh, you know, multiple dairy items, a lot of those basic food items. And while I know now we currently uh, serve the community uh, in two different locations, uh, one nearby down at the YMCA with our mobile uh, food uh, truck or mobile food store, uh, this will be a permanent, you know, offering for all these items. So we think this will be a great uh, service to the community as well. Plus, it can be a gathering spot, you know, to meet somebody to uh, for lunch or to have a coffee and uh, enjoy our free Wi-Fi. Okay, thank you, Light. Uh, if we can go to the last slide, please. Um, just for the commission's benefit, this has been our process to date. Uh, we, um, as indicated, have had extensive meetings with Council Bur Councilman Burgess' staff, uh, city planning. Uh, the Homewood Community Development Collaborative, both with their executive committee and at a development activities meeting. Um, and we are continuing to carry on those conversations. Uh, most recently, Mark Ferguson was in attendance at a, a community meet and greet uh, uh, meeting to uh, uh, just make sure we know what's going on in the community. So uh, with that, we're happy to open it up to questions and we look forward to the commission's action on this uh, uh, proposal. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. At this time, we open the floor for public testimony. Uh, does it look like there uh, might be any hands raised for public testimony? Yes, we have uh, Sergey Gorloff. Uh, Mr. Gorloff, I'm going to promote you, and you have three minutes to provide your testimony. Please state and spell your name um, for the record. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergey Gorlov, and uh, I uh, I'm a businessman. I have a few convenience stores and gas stations in in, in Pittsburgh uh, overall, but also specifically, I have two in Homewood and uh, three in East Liberty. And uh, um, the proposed get go. Uh, this is what I think. Proposed get-go will not serve the convenience and welfare of the public of the Homewood community. Um, why? Number of reasons. 
most important is um, GetCo has clearly indicated in its proposed plan and verbally and during the community workshop that it plans to seek a liquor license. GetGo proposed site plan shows 240 square foot beer cooler in the store. Another source of alcohol, particularly when sold from a location that for four C's operating 24 seven in the future, will not create safer or healthier neighborhood. This, this neighborhood that already has high crime rate. If I don't know how to do it, but if I could, I would open a crime heat map of Pittsburgh and you can clearly see, you would be clearly see that Homewood and nearby communities are um, identified as most dangerous, most dangerous. I can testify to that uh, unfortunate, uh, <clears throat> that, to that unfortunate category because I'm serving this community for 30 years. As I said, I have gas stations and convenience stores. Uncounted amount of time my employees were shot at the cash register. I had uh, cases where young gangs were uh, shooting on my parking lots, killing people, uh, assaulting people in a bad way. So this community is already, um, is already vulnerable. And if you look at the Homewood community plan, it identifies as a major public health and safety concern, the fact that liquor licenses for Homewood businesses are often perceived to be associated to high crimes. And I can confirm myself because I also had, I don't have them anymore, thank God, but I also had two stores in Virginia uh, and uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia. And those stores we were serving beer. And that was clear that beer brings loitering, trash, violence, uh, nothing good comes from the beer. So, and, and it's, and it's not only my, my uh, testimony, also, um, but uh, let me read the, uh, the home community plan. Identifies... Can I just uh, stop for one second? You're just over three minutes. If you could just go ahead and wrap up, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll try. So, uh, so, so I get go proposed to introduce another source of alcohol to an already vulnerable and impacted neighborhood. It does nothing to address the community's current concerns. Studies show that greater availability of commercial alcohol in association with increased alcohol use and related public health risks, such as intimate partner violence, sexual assaults, underage drinking, and suicide, as well as a crime. Uh, John Hopkins School of Public Health come up with the study that says such stores have been shown to be an important component of the social infrastructure that destabilizes communities. In the same Thank study, Mr. Gor Mr. Gorloff, yes. we are grateful for your testimony. I, I think that um, uh, unless you have um, a little bit different to add, uh, could we wrap up so that we, it looks like we have other folks that want to give some public testimony as well. Okay, I hear you. So, so in, in, in any, in, in any, um, anyway, obviously I bring the alcohol, alcohol to our already vulnerable community is not a good idea. And uh, it will create lottering, it will create uh, higher, it will even more increase uh, crime rate. And so the, for this reason, uh, and for a number of others, uh, for I don't have a time to uh, tell them, but you have my letter and the uh, rest of uh, rest of my um, rest of, uh, of my uh, um, application is there. Thank you, Mr. Gorloff. We appreciate your testimony. 
Uh, now following up, it seems that there are other hands raised. Yes, we have uh, Leonard Carter. Um, you've been unmuted. Please state and spell your name for the record, and you have three minutes to provide your testimony. My name is Leonard Carter, L-E-O-N-A-R-D-C-A-R-T-E-R. -E -E is that good enough? Yes, That's you can go great. Ahead. Thank you. I am a lifelong taxpaying resident of the city of Pittsburgh. I'm a retired teacher and football coach from the Pittsburgh Board of Public Education, where I worked for more than 40 years. I'm also a member of Mad Dads, which is an organization dedicated to the betterment of our community, through which I've donated countless hours over the past 17 years to this region. It would have been less expensive for me to live outside the city. I also could have chosen to work elsewhere. I chose to stay, live, and work here and attempt to improve my neighborhood and community. My home, you saw the, in the, the pictures that you were shown, my home wasn't shown. It will be directly across the street on Kelly Street. Over the past 15 years, I've been remodeling my family home, which was purchased in 1964. Currently, I've spent more than $150,000 towards its restoration. My goal, obviously, is to improve my home and that of my neighborhood. I did so with the knowledge that the block on which it is located was zoned as residential. I watched as the surrounding properties were abandoned, dilapidated, and eventually torn down. Uh, there are currently three homes left on the block, which uh, each remaining owner is doing similar work to myself. The property for this pro proposed project has been in horrible condition for the past two decades. There's been abandoned vehicles, trash dumping, and weeds over three to four feet. Um, and only the lot that's directly adjacent to mine and the one directly across the street from it, they've been maintained in some fashion by the URA. So those were in some, those were taken care of somewhat. The rest of the thing across the street, it's been in horrible condition and the city has not, you know, helped with that. Uh, I often called the city to have the problem addressed only to be told the uh, owner was a corporation in Florida and there was little, if anything, that could be done to alleviate the situation. When I first heard of this proposed project about a year ago, I contacted Councilman Burgess's office to inquire. I was told they had no knowledge of any such project, which obviously was untrue. Now, if this project goes through, it'll cause many problems for the residents of this block. The traffic the noise, the trash that will accompany this business will be substantial. The lighting that businesses require to attract customers will be disruptive as well. Now, it seems to me those are just some of the reasons to not have businesses in residential districts. And this is and has been a residential district. Um, I have had an opportunity to meet with some Giant Eagle officials. They have suggested the company will be willing to hear my concerns, but there are no assurances if those you know, concerns will be addressed and in what manner. Now, had I been aware of the possibility of a project like this, I would not have taken the time, effort, and money or expense to remodel my home. And what does this say to other homeowners in the area? You know, I believe it's a warning. The same thing can happen to you. you know, how are residents supposed to have confidence in the city that their, neighbor, their, their neighborhood, their block will be protected? And just listening earlier to this, um, wh whatever this is, the last project, they were talking about how they were in contact with the neighborhood and the neighbors and the people that lived there. That did not happen in this case. It seemed like it was important in that neighborhood, but not important in my neighborhood. Um, and, and, and you're just over three minutes. If you can go ahead and wrap it up, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, there's another, there was another proposed project on my block. And even though it wouldn't take rezoning because it will affect me, that company remained in constant contact with me. And they were the ones that let me know about the possible uh, get-go. That's the first place I heard it. Now, it's disconcerting to say the least that the immediate area around my home will be at the mercy and whim of a corporation. And despite my commitment to the neighborhood and the fact that I will be greatly affected by the project, I have no voice in what will occur. For those reasons and others, I, I oppose the project. Thank you, Mr. Carter, for your testimony. Okay. We appreciate your testimony. Um, are there any other hands raised? There are no other hands raised. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank those who have given testimony. Then I want to... Uh, remind um, commissioners that um, 
this would be a recommendation, uh, but the criteria that we are to be looking at regarding uh, this application is 922.05.F. Um, you know, at this time, commissioners, are there uh, comments? Are there questions? Um, you know, even a, a, a motion, but I imagine that there is probably some, some discussion. Commissioner Mingo? Um, I'd like to ask the question that the last um, person who testified raised. Um, when we do look at the blocks across from the rear part of the proposed zone change, there do seem like there are houses on Kelly Street and on Frankstown Avenue that that face um, the proposed zoning lot changed. Um, and I'd like to know a couple of things. One, um, have you spoken to those property owners and do those, uh, are those properties owned by homeowners? Um, are they vacant? Are they occupied? Yes, I, this is Mark Ferguson with John. Mark, Mark before you talk, I, if I could just make one point. Um, with respect to the properties on the opposite side of Frankstown Avenue, Commissioner, those properties, um, they may be houses, but they're, they're in a UI zone. So th those are not necessarily residentially zoned right now. Um, and I'll let Mark uh, describe the uh, community engagement that uh, Giant Eagle has followed so far. Thank you. I, I did speak to Mr. Carter. I went to his house. Uh, he invited me in. We had a, a great conversation. I, I definitely hear, heard and hear his concern. Uh, we will be working with him, but this is, like I have explained to him, this is just for the rezone of the land, not so much the development portion, which once, you know, if we do get the approval to get rezoned, you know, next steps, obviously the approval for the development. So then, you know, I would work with them and the community group more to, uh, address the concerns of, you know, lighting. Uh, you know, I explained to him that the building will be turned. The front entrance won't be facing his house across from Cali. It'll be facing either Fifth or uh, Frankstown, which is a, another thing that others have brought up that we'll uh, work through in that development stage. But, you know, I spoke with him. I understand his complaints and I We'll look forward to working with him if this gets approved to, to do as much as I can to help his alleviate his concerns. Um, uh, Commissioner Mingo, uh, might it be helpful for you uh, based on your question? Uh, could we go back to the presentation and pull up the, the zoning map so that Commissioner Mingo can get an idea of where Kelly faces uh, the proposed uh, consolidation and potential uh, future proposed project. Uh, Commissioner Mingo. Falk, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. Ms. Burton Falk, but I, I, this is the core report. I need to know who was just speaking. Uh, I'm sorry, Dylan, that was Mr. Mark Ferguson, F-E-R-G-U-S-O-N. Um, he's uh, uh, a, a development uh, a person with Giant Eagle. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. McKeegan. Um, Commissioner Mingo, are there any questions with relation to this? And does that help you understand where the, yes. the last? Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Burton Falk. I am a chairperson, Burton Falk. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it, it does it does help understand me understand um you know it's tricky because I did participate in the zoning process rezoning process oh so many years ago the last time we did that not in this um, section of the city but in you know my own section of the city and I do remember that there were parcels like this that were left in what looks like when you look at the map, sort of islands where there was an intention to leave residential in this sort of island. Now, in this case, this residential island, which may have been left that way on purpose, and I can't remember what year was that, 90, 90 something or another. <laughs> it was the 90s. Um, 
now those properties are are vacant and there isn't whoever was advocating for this to stay residential in this UI zone. Now it's now it's a vacant parcel, but there are still people across the street on Kelly Avenue, on Kelly Street. And it's always tricky for me to try and figure out what the what the right things to do, even though it's surrounded by UI. It was very intentionally left this way, I have to imagine. Um, at that time. So I'm, I'm simply asking um, that question to try and um, what the context is of this place. So there may be houses across the street on Frankstown that are occupied by homeowners or renters that are in a UI um, zoned area. Is, and that's, I think, what you're saying, Mr. McKeegan. That's correct. That's correct. And, and I'd point out, Commissioner Mingo, as, as we said during the presentation, and, and I do appreciate Mr. Carter's remarks quite a bit, um, the property has been vacant, essentially vacant, really since the 90s. That's when it was started to be cleared, both by the URA, which owns a number of these parcels, and by uh, the private out-of-town owner. Um, as far as I know, nobody has considered this property for any sort of residential development. Um, so, you're, you're exactly right. You're left with kind of this vacant island that nobody seems to want to do anything with. And the only person who does is admittedly a commercial type development. Um, I, I'd only, this will not assuage Mr. Carter's fears. I recognize that. But this is only the very first step on a long process that will involve quite a bit of planning, quite a bit of site plan review, quite a bit of negotiation, both with the community, with Mr. Carter, with the Department of City Planning, uh, but we can't really start down that road until the property is in an appropriate zoning classification. So that's all that, again, I don't want to, I don't want to um, uh, um, make light, make, make, make small light of any of these concerns. I just think it's a little bit premature, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that um, clarification. I do know that from living near the edge of, you know, Baum and Center and Negley that we here in our neighborhood have a number of these issues that do get resolved through in the next stage of the process. Um, so I, I, I do appreciate that. And I know that Giant Eagle is a long time um, good neighbor um, and will we'll make good decisions. Can I just ask one more question, which the first um, person asked, which was, uh, is there an intention to serve beer and liquor at this store? Yes, that is the intention of every get-go. I do want to point out that there is a, a beer distributor right across the street, um, um, right across Kelly on 5th. Uh, but yes, it's every get-go, you know, the alcohol sales helps. Uh, you know, our intent will not be to open 24 seven as that gentleman had stated. It is to close mm -hmm. at 10, mirror the hours. We have a get go on Penn Avenue in Wilkinsburg. So that's basically the world mirror that. There will be security guards uh, or guard, I should say, um, as well. Because um, I know he had some concerns about um, uh, ro robberies and et cetera, whatever. So, uh, Yes, there will be, we will seek alcohol to be served there. Okay. And, and I, I just to clarify Mark's remarks, um, obviously the liquor license approval process is outside of the Planning Commission's jurisdiction, number one. Uh, number two, um, Pennsylvania does allow um, uh, liquor sales in grocery stores now. Uh, this is not a place where it would be for on-site consumption. Uh, and I think the important point, which shouldn't get lost in this discussion, is that the Homewood uh, plan uh, clearly called for more food um, uh, opportunities in the neighborhood. Uh, and this, uh, um, this project is really designed to help address uh, that community need. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mingo. Commissioner O'Neill? Uh, so I wanted to echo what Mr. McKeegan says, um, the zoning code and planning commission don't have any um, jurisdiction over regulating alcohol. And I don't think that should be impacting this decision. I don't think that was why the question came up, but I just want to be clear on the record. Uh, but my 
kind of second thought, uh, I understand fully that this is a rezoning and not an approval of the use or the site plan. And um, I like to stick to those kind of criteria when we're evaluating. At the same time, um, the applicant said that there are kind of multiple opportunities to continue discussions with the community. In a UI district, I don't know that that's entirely true. Uh, this would probably be going through site plan review and wouldn't have another public approval unless you were seeking any sort of variances or planning commission. Um, I, I don't know that we would be in play. Is that the case? Are there are you expecting to request variances or other public approvals, or is this something that you're hoping to have approved by right? Well, a, uh, a service station, which I think this falls within the category, uh, is a special exception. Uh, is it? So, okay. so, so there would be, uh, at a minimum, there would be a zoning a zoning board of adjustment proceeding for that. Uh, I I don't want to. Um, commit that we would be seeking variances because my goal is always to have projects that don't need them. Right. But uh, given, given the um, uh, codes requirements for setbacks, uh, where entrances can be placed, uh, ground floor glazing and the like, um, you oftentimes get into those design issues that do require uh, some sort of relief. Um, I've, I've encountered that in similar situations. Um, uh, and uh, I suspect at the end of the day, too, uh, given that, how do I want to say this, given that, that um, uh, the Planning Commission rightfully wants to not have the city look like the suburbs, uh, that this uh, project is probably one that they would refer us to CDAP and the Planning Commission for some sort of site plan consideration as well. Uh, I do know, as I mentioned at the briefing two weeks ago, uh, that there's a similar get-go uh, proposed um, uh, at uh, 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 the West End Bridge, uh, and that project is being sent to CDAP. So I, I would expect that to happen here as well. Okay. Uh, I am very quickly looking at this, and it looks like in the urban industrial district, uh, service station is an admin exception, not a special exception. Uh, you may be right, but... <laughs> Um, so I, I just want to be clear um, that we expect you to continue to talk to um, Mr. Carter moving forward, and hopefully there are those opportunities for additional public meetings and public approvals, uh, but even absent that, uh, we expect that conversation to keep moving forward. I know there are some protections in the zoning code, like you said, um, for residential districts nearby. Um, but we want to make sure that someone who moved into a residential district and is maybe not going to be living next to one moving forward still has some of those protections. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, are there any other uh, comments or questions? Again, you know, I'll refer you uh, to the section of the code that we're supposed to be looking at here. Um, if we feel that this criteria um, has been met, a 922.05.F, um, and if there's further discussion uh, and or a, a motion, that's open. Further discussion? All right. So uh, based on the criteria in um, our report, this would be a um, recommended a positive approval or a re or positive recommendation to city council on this zone change. Uh, is there a motion from the floor? Okay. So it, is there a motion? I, I don't have no. a motion, but I, I do have another question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the discussion that there might be other gas stations that are closing on this particular section of Fifth Avenue, and this has not been a place where there has been much planning other than the Homewood plan, but like in Bomb Boulevard or Center Avenue, there's 
been extensive sort of specific planning about that commercial district. That might not be the way that we one would want to go in this neighborhood, but it does seem like if this is a place where a lot of change is happening, are there plans in the city to think very strategically about this section of land here? Oops. Mr. Carter? Ah, yes. Again, this is Sean Carter from the Office of Councilman Burgess. Uh, Commissioner Mingo, to your question, um, I've been in this job for 15 years. And so I've seen not all of the community plans, but most of the community plans from, from inception through the community process, so to speak, and to publication. And I can tell you that all over Homewood, um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, there's a there's a senior low rise at the corner of uh, North Homewood Avenue and Finance Street, directly across from uh, the Homewood East Busway stop. Well, the plan that Councilman Burgess funded in 2008 called for us to build um, apartment buildings with first level retail. And so that was the plan for three years until the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Association showed up one day and said, here's $11 million. You're going to build a senior low rise right there. And we said, wait, wait, no, that's that's not what we had intended. And we built it. Um, it we had to come to the planning commission there and the zoning board. There was quite a bit of contention from the neighborhood, but it did serve a, a, a vulnerable population, seniors, and we had to be flexible enough to go go down that road. Now, Spilling over from that, we did get um, 30 to 40 um, townhomes built behind it, which absolutely helped put more families in. In fact, I think we probably got more townhomes out of it than we would have apartment units. And so we had to be flexible there. Um, quite often, and if my memory serves, what was supposed to go at this corner was a very large apartment complex. I mean, we were shown plans, the you know, potential developers. Had come, I mean, this was six, seven years ago. Um, but the market conspired to not ever allow that to happen. And so, you know, this was Hook Fish and Chicken. It still is at the moment. And it's one of my favorite food joints. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, but we had denied every previous request for the rezoning of these parcels, um, frankly, because we weren't given the request by an owner that we had any confidence in, in terms of being a good corporate citizen or a good neighbor. And in fact, one of Reverend Burgess's demands to the development team was that he would not consider a zone change until they had site control because changing the, the zoning from R1DL, which is very restrictive to urban industrial, even after you account for the residential compatibility standards, allows for a lot more intensive uses than the existing zoning. And so we were uncomfortable doing that for the previous ownership. Um, and we required the site assemblage before we would even move this step. Um, and Reverend Burgess is comfortable that this is a good use for this site. And so that's why... Um, after several months of back and forth with the development team, he opted to introduce the zone change petition. Um, we're always going to have those concerns. Um, you know, per personally, we would prefer a 24-7 get-go, but I think you have to be um, at least somewhat concerned of the concerns of the people who live closest to it. That is not what they want. Um, and so there's balance there. It may not be perfect. And... Um, there will be some residents, unfortunately, who are still upset about it. And that is often one of the trade-offs we make. But that site was going to sit there in its present condition for perhaps another decade. And that motivated Reverend Burgess to um, go for this project as well. And I hope I answered your question. Uh, thank you for that response. Commissioner O'Neill. Uh, I was going to motion to recommend approval. Unless there's all right. There. Uh, all right. I uh, will accept the motion on the floor. 
Uh, do we have a second? I second. Commissioner Cantania. All right. Um, before taking a full on vote, you know, I um, would strongly uh, recommend that um, the Giant Eagle team really uh, echoing uh, Commissioner O'Neill continue to work with the community. Uh, as time goes on, maybe this development can evolve to something that is um, more beneficial to the community, not just this, but maybe it can morph into this and something else, um, that there's more reciprocity uh, you know, to the community in, in other ways. And having said that, um, we have a motion on the floor, a second, um, and then I'll um, do roll call. Uh, Commissioner Burton Falk. Aye. Commissioner Dick. Aye. And I would second what you and Commissioner O'Neill said about uh, going back and forth with the community. It's, I think it's essential. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Dick. Commissioner Mingo. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner O'Neill? Aye. And Commissioner Cantania? Aye. Okay, it looks like the uh, motion uh, passes that we are making a positive recommendation uh, to City Council, but that doesn't mean stop here and breathe easy. That means ramp it up, connect with the community, figure out how to make this a wonderful project and not just a what you think is a good project. Um, something that that really wraps its arms around the community in a different way, especially considering those are, uh, there are folks here today uh, that are immediately impacted. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Burton Falk, if I could just quickly respond. Uh, I do appreciate your remarks. Um, I think, um, uh, I, I can give you my assurance that we will we will continue down the path that you've uh, laid out. Uh, we certainly don't intend this to be a stopping point, uh, and we you, you have our commitment to continue to work with the community. So I, th I appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKeegan, and I will hold you to that commitment. I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, absolutely. Uh, a good day to to you and your team. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Thank you. I uh, will. Thank you. You're welcome, everyone. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is agenda item E, and that is a director's report. And I understand that we'll have some director's report. Thank you, Chair Burton Falk. And thanks, everyone, uh, for a great planning commission meeting. Um, it's so nice to go right into director's report after hearing in action. Um, so I wanted to just use this time to make a brief announcement and um, acknowledgement that uh, two of our staff, uh, Joe Fraker and Mariam Maradian, have been promoted to senior planner for commissions and code development. Uh, which is the position that uh, works uh, directly with the Planning Commission and preparing reports and presentations, reviewing projects, and uh, all of the other fun work that goes into uh, making sure that you look wonderful and that the meetings run smoothly and that there's a quorum and all of that. So, um, uh, we're really excited. Uh, uh, both of both of uh, these staff members have been with the department for uh, a while now, and uh, it's a really uh, excellent progression for them professionally. So uh, I know you have some familiarity with Joe, who's uh, been helping to make sure the commission meetings run smoothly, quietly in the back end. Um, so you might get to see him a little bit more and also um, excited that you get to work with Mariam as well. So uh, just wanted to call that out and uh, say thanks to them for accepting and um, make sure that uh, you recognize their faces as you should see them again soon. Well, so that looks like some commissioners uh, want to make comment. Commissioner Dick. A warm welcome to you both. We'll look forward to working with you. 
I just want to say thank you. And it's an honor for me to work with the planning commissioner and with the planning team. And I hope I can do my best. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity. And I look forward to working closely with all of you in the, the months and years ahead. Thank you. Well, Mariam and uh, Joe, congratulations. Uh, we're excited to have you here and look forward to the journey. Um, best to both of you. I know you'll you'll continue to do fabulous work. All right, so you're very welcome. Uh, so I think that might conclude, right? The end of the director's report. A very wonderful June 27, 2023. Uh, meeting. Thank you all uh, for being here today. We appreciate everyone. I think we can get a motion to adjourn. No moved. All right. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay.